Welcome to today's episode of the Group X Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Zanato. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to show your support, then head on over to the website and click on the Patreon link to find out how to become a show supporter. Today, I'll be talking to Matt Thraxton, Head Training Manager for Les Mills China. We discuss the butterfly effect and how one small thing we do can have a huge influence on others. So grab your favorite beverage, sit back and enjoy the show. Matt, welcome to the Group X podcast, mate. It's good to see you. Oh, mate, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to see you, my friend. And uh, yeah, I've been I've been been watching your podcast lately and uh, catching up with the old team from Aussie. You know, Lee and Wendy and Sammy and the guys. So now nah, it's been really cool because it's uh, obviously I was there for four and a half, five years, and I've been away for almost five years now. So. It's a nice little trip down memory lane, so you're, you're, you're keeping us all connected, mate. Awesome, appreciate mate. That. Thank you so much, and thank you for tuning in from the other side of the world as well. I appreciate that, and I'm sure that those guys that uh, have uh, that know you, that know you've listened to their episodes as well, would be really appreciative. So, hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, some good stuff. It's thank cool. you, mate. So, thank Matt, tell us, let's, uh, let's kick it off right from the beginning so that I get a bit more of an understanding. I mean, I know you, but I don't know you all that well. How did you get into the group exercise or how did you get into the, the fitness industry? Where did your journey begin? I've always, I've always been a bit of a sporty kid. So, you know, play, played football at school and played all the sports. I was big into skateboarding when I was younger, so I was doing that every day. Um, and then when you went go away to college and carry on playing sports and start getting into to training in the gym to try and build a little bit more strength, um, and then to, to university and playing football. And, and I went to the States. So while I was studying at uni, I did my uh, coaching badge for football. Um, I think they call it UA for C license now. It used to be called like the FA Prelim Award or something, but yep. it was just your basic football qualification that you could coach kids. And then uh, and I went to the States in the summer to coach kids, came back and then went to the States again for a second year. And that second year, I got offered a job to stay, coach a local high school. So. This was 2001, so I was coaching high school football, boys and girls, um, and then I was a substitute teacher. Cool. So what happened is you end up substitute teaching almost every day because they, they needed people. Yep. Um, and I started being the substitute PE teacher, but on the regular. So I was coaching the high school soccer team, doing the PE classes, and I was training at Gold's Gym, and this was North Carolina in the USA. So Gold's Gym, North Carolina, USA, and it was 2002, and... Uh, the manageress, Terry, she came up to me and said, uh, oh, hey, do you want to teach body pump? And I was like, no. You know, I, was, I was a typical <laughs> guy. I, mean, I, I played football and I lifted weights. You know, that's, yep. that's what I did. That's, yeah. And I could see the group fitness room and, and you know, for, for, want of a, for want of a better description, it, it just looked like a room full of bored middle-aged housewives doing <laughs> yoga. A step, you know? That was my perception of group yeah. fitness. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, nah, honestly, she goes, I think you'd be really good at it. She said, my husband Bobby's going on the training. And of course, when she says her husband Bobby's going, she meant I told Bobby he's doing the training. <laughs> so it'd be great if you could go with him so he's got a friend. <laughs> and um and I was good mates with Bobby, so so we thought, yeah, screw it, why not? And and, and she gave us it was it was VHS cassette back in those days wow. as well. So yep. Yep. Body Pump forty four. It was a VHS cassette, took it home and watched it. And I thought, Wow, this this is cool. So so you had you had Mike McSweeney, uh there was a Lenny Lenny Tikatow, hopefully I'm saying his name right. He's a Maori boy from from Auckland, and uh, and then Michelle Bridges. Oh wow! So she, she was, yep. Yeah, yeah. So that was Pump Forty Four, and of course they're up there on this big stage. It's a big room. There's lots of people there. You know, Mike's tanned. He's oiled up with baby oil. He's got the short <laughs> shorts on. He's got the tight vest. He's got like three different wristbands on. He's got the Oakley sunglasses on his head. Yep. And I am like, what the hell is this shit? This is <laughs> mental. <laughs> The room was going off, you know, and, and, and this guy had a twinkle in his eye and he's lifting good weights and it's good technique and the music's pumping and, and you can just see, yeah, there's something in this. You know, yep. This looks really cool and, and I'd love to give this a go. So I'd never been to a group fitness class. I didn't know anything about group fitness, nothing about Les Mills. I just watched this video because Terry tapped me on the shoulder and said, it'd be cool if hey. you could go. We think it'd be quite good. Five of us from the gym went on the training, Terry, her husband, Bobby, myself and two others. Um, and, and I was just bitten. So that weekend, the trainer was a guy called Mike LaPlaca, who was an Italian-American dude, a uh, track athlete in, in college. So, you know, he had that good-looking, good, he had good looking, nice body. He was charming, charismatic, you know, and 
you sat in this two-day training going shit this guy is really cool yep. and everyone loves lifting weights to music this this is this is a bit of me i just i just want to do what he does yeah like and yep. i just idolized him so so i had this kind of butterfly effect moment where terry tapped him on the shoulder and said how do you fancy teaching pump because i never would have chosen it and then i saw mike mcsweeney up on the screen and i thought damn that guy's cool That's, yeah <laughs> yeah program looks good and then the weekend training with this guy michael placca um and and it just i know we sort of use it you know life-changing experience and, and it can sound a bit of a cliche but for me that was that after that weekend like i didn't even know les mills existed or body palm or this training job and then from that weekend, I was like, I want to be a Lesmos trainer. I want to do what Mike LaPlaca does. That's, That's the awesome. job that I want. Yeah. And then I never really existed. So I was just a, a complete obsessed body pump nut from then on. We were doing it every day. <laughs> at five. We trained together. We'd buy the same shoes so we could launch and look cool. We'd, yep. And back then it was Nike. So Nike shocks. Yes. Remember the Nike shocks? Yeah. The little, yep. And you, you could send away and get your own color with your name yeah. put on. And all. Yep. We used to do all that stuff <laughs> and print t-shirts and and, and where the gym is in North Carolina, it's, it's Moorhead City, North Carolina. It's in this big parking lot, you know, it's a very typical U.S. kind of parking lot with all the shops around the side. And there, there was an Applebee's, you know, and, and so, which is a, you know, a, like a TGI Friday's cafe. Yeah, yep. so, so we'd do the body pump launch. We'd all go to the Applebee's. We'd have chicken wings and burgers and beers afterwards. <laughs> so it was a real community. And, and so what happened with me is, is, is I discovered this thing that I'd never knew existed by way of someone tapping me on the shoulder. Sure, yeah. Quite by chance. Yeah. And I became part of this community, and, you know, and so what started out as being, I want to be the instructor on stage teaching because it looks cool and, you know, it's it's cool to be the go-to guy and you're on stage and people go, oh, thank you for the class and they love you for it. And so there's a little bit of that role model thing there where you're, you know, a cool person doing a cool job. Yep. And people like being in your room. But as the sort of months and years go on, you start to realize, actually, this has quite a profound effect on people and this yeah. whole thing of community it's bigger than just doing, you know, a 2-2 deadlift or a 3-1 deadlift. And then when you start to see, well, actually, if you're a trainer, instead of influencing the 20 people in your class, now you can influence 20 instructors to go back to their class and they inspire 20 other people each. So now you're talking to 400 people. Yeah. So you start to realize that, holy cow, this thing's actually quite a cool thing that can make a huge difference out there in this, you know, world of people just trying to be a little bit healthier, a little bit happier. Yeah. It just happens to be that, the way I started was moving a barbell. Yeah. It could have been punching, kicking thin air. It could yeah. have been riding a bike. It could, yeah. have been, it could have been Zumba. It could have been Pilates. It could have been kettlebells. Yeah. It's, you know. Yeah. So I, so I, so I feel really blessed that, that I had this moment where I was given that opportunity. I, you know, I didn't seek it out. I didn't do classes for three yeah. years and then yeah. I'd like to do it completely by chance, but it changed my life. And, and then I talk about it quite often when I do my trainings, that that butterfly effect moment is something that, I want to be for other people. So I, so I spent the last 20 years trying to be Terry for everybody else. Yes. So if I'm doing a training, you know, I, I just hope that I say or do something that has a profound effect on one or oh, two man. people yeah. the way that you had on me. Yeah. You know, and if in 20 years, someone turns around and says, oh man, I did a training. This, this English guy, Matt Faxon. Yeah, it's really cool. I just, it just made me feel comfortable and I wanted to really do this thing. And yep. they went on and had a great career. Yeah. You know, that that's the, that's sort of the legacy part of, of what we do. And, and the great thing about it is, is everyone has the opportunity to do that. Yep. So, you know, Terry isn't special. I'm not special. No one else is. We're all equipped with the same tools. Yeah. We all have an opportunity to say or do something that, boom, Makes completely alters impact. someone else's yeah. life. And, yeah. and, and, then that, and that's when I started realizing that, you know, this stuff's really, really powerful. This is the Group X Podcast. I, I really appreciate hearing that backstory and how you actually took your first steps into what has obviously been a, a bloody amazing career uh, to date for you. That's fantastic. I want to ask you a question back on on your module training that you did. Mm. Obviously, you've been involved in, in module training as well throughout the years. How was that module training that you were in compared to the ones you've actually conducted yourself? Was it different? <laughs> Yeah, so, so back then it was a three-day training over two weekends. So you do Saturday, Sunday, and then two weeks later, you come back for either a Saturday or a Sunday for day three. Yep. Um, and then in the States, there was a lot more of, of club launch and the business side on that day too. So there, there's branding and marketing and there's was, there was quite a lot. So I think it was sort of the early-ish days of it being in the States. And so they really wanted to make sure the branding, the marketing, the image, you know, you're upholding yep. the essence of... 
of, yep. of the business as well as just teaching the class. So what you had is you had three full days with a group of people. So there was a very big connection piece. You know, it, it, it was quite emotional because you get connected with these people and, and the trainer spends a lot of time with you. And of course, when, you, when you've got more hours with someone, you can get deeper into this thing. Um, and in that two weeks in between, you know, you're, you're practicing, you're, you're, you're in the mirror, you're doing your technique, you're, you're scripting your cues. You know, you're getting nervous because when you come back for day three, that's going to be an assessment, you know. Yep. So it, it just felt like a, a, a huge part of your life, you know, this, this two days, the two weeks, and then the third day. Um, so essentially, the, the, the structure is still very similar. It's still these five key elements. Yep. You know, you still got to get competency and achieve a certain level of competency in choreography, technique, and coaching. Um, we're now trying to get more involved with, with connection and performance because we kind of know that those are the two key elements that really fill the room and make a difference. So yes. yep. whereas the first three key elements make sure you deliver a safe, effective class, you know, to make people want to come back, to be inspired and to make an experience that people are like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. It's connection and performance. So the newer trainings, we've shifted connection and performance to day one. Yep. So we're starting to put a bit more weight in those two keys, which I think is really cool. Back in my day, it was just the first three key elements with the main focus. Yes. Yep. But that's been the same right up until you know recent years, so the last year or two when we've actually started to change. So in terms of all the years of trainings that I've done, it was those three days again. Yep. The same thing. And then when I went back to the UK, you know, we, we I think it was the UK where we where we, we trialed it's three consecutive days. Oh wow. So the same training but three consecutive days for a while. And we, and we rolled out a lot of trainings. I think it was David Lloyd. So I was I was doing like some midweek training, some weekend training. Yeah. Was, you were almost a full time trainer. It was, it yep. was a lot of work. But the cool thing about that is it meant you got bloody good at it. You yeah. Because you're training yeah. almost every weekend and some midweeks. So, you know, you know your training content, you know your stories, your anecdotes, you know the jokes to put in. Yes. You know, you know what you're seeing, you know how to find the key thing in someone that they need to, to, to move forward. Yeah. So I, I actually, funnily enough, I actually had someone send me a picture recently in it, and it was my first training. So I, I was sort of fast tracked. So I, so I became an instructor on Pump 44. Yep. But I delivered my first training as a trainer on Pump 47. Oh, wow. So only three years later. Yeah. Was that in, so, back in the US or was that? US, yeah, back in yeah. the US. So, so what happened is, and it was, it's quite a funny story because, well, an embarrassing story really, but obviously back then you had to send in your video to be assessed, you know, it's a, a VHS cassette, you know, so you're recording your class, transferring it onto VHS cassette. Anyway, so I thought it'd be funny. I, I don't, have, you, have you seen Top Gun? You yeah. must have seen Top Gun yeah. the movie. Yeah, yes. Where he sings <laughs> like, you never close your eyes. Yeah. And, and that. So I thought it'd be funny to sing that. And so I'm doing the, I'm straight down the barrel of the camera. You know, I'm in the office at Gold's Gym, straight down the barrel of the camera, singing my heart out. And I, and I can't sing, but I'm singing. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, that Sinead O'Connor video, nothing compares to you, where it's just her face in full camera. That's me going, you never close your eyes. And I'm giving it large, oh. but I knew it was terrible. So then what I do is I splice that in. So I go, well, you know, I've always wanted to be a rock star, but obviously I can't sing. So the next best thing will be a Les Mills trainer. Yep. And so when I sent in my certification <laughs> video on pump 44 i asked them to, to i wanted to be a trainer so i sung that song and at the time it was, Kat, it was an aussie kathy spencer browning so she, yes. she's still running the company over there it's just called uh mossa now yep but it was bts for a while it, yeah but yeah so, so back then it was you know, les mills and bts with were, were a partnership body training systems this the step company and uh and she told me the story where she goes this came on and she just pissed herself laughing. And her, her husband, uh, Terry, she's like, Terry, come in here. You've got to watch this. And she played it again and watched. And then we have to invite this guy to boot camp. He is incredible. <laughs> and I think it was just, it was just, it was so out there and dumb, you know, because they're sitting down and watching all these videos time yeah. and time again. Yep. And all of a sudden, this idiot pops up. <laughs> and then I remember, and I got a phone call. And, and again, I mean, it was, I don't know how many days later, a couple of weeks, whatever. I was, I was in the same office, sat down, and the phone patched through. And it was Kathy Spencer. And I went, hello? Oh, Kathy Spencer. And I thought it was my mates taking the piss. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, oh, she, she told me that story. And I was like, and it was really bizarre because I don't get starstruck, but I was kind of a little dumbfounded because yep. I just completely wasn't expecting it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Like, look, it was amazing. She told me the story when she asked her husband to come in and watch it again, and they pissed themselves laughing. <laughs> they were eating sushi at the time. I can still remember it. <laughs> and I went to this, this boot camp and... And the thing is, in the states, they were doing a lot of modules. So I, so I literally train because because you, you follow a system of five trainings. You observe a training, then you do twenty five percent of the next one, then you yep. deliver fifty percent, seventy five and a hundred. So 
five times you go out on the training and yeah. I went out on five initial trainings with five different trainers. Wow. So I tried an amazing like start to, to, to my training career and, you know, and I can still remember the people I went out with, yep. you know, and then I got signed off by Noel, the, the, the fifth training, he comes out, watches you do your hundred percent and signs you off. Um, but yes, Scott Parker, Scopar, we used to call him. Uh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff and Wendy, a husband and wife couple. I went out with those two. And Kathy Spence is obviously the, the, you know, she's the one that's doing your coaching just, training. Yeah. And feedback. Yep. So, I, so instead of just learning the training content, I learned five different styles of delivery and I'm picking up all these skills yeah. from these five people on how to connect, how to set the room up, what music to play, bringing people sweets and coffees and playing quizzes and, and wearing different clothes and just all these amazing skills that meant once I started delivering, you know, I was on a roll. And, and so, I, so I felt like, you know, I, I was... I just felt like I'd found what I was supposed to do. Yep. You know, so so if I was comparing it, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think the trainers that, that trained me did an incredible job. So Mike LaPlaca was day one and two, yep. but he wasn't available to do the third day. It was a, it was a lady called Natalie Weber. Um, and, and I still keep in touch now, you know, and I can still remember yep. my next training was Body Step, and that was Erin Delaney on Body Step 51. Yep. And I, you know, I came back to the UK and Maria Tabler, she trained me on Body Combat 21. How many programs Carl are you trained in then? How many are up to uh, sleep? So, so, so I did pump, step, attack, combat, RPM, uh, CX works or CX30 so, as it used to be called. Yeah. Was cool. um, I've got grit, sprint, the trip, uh, body balance. I, I, I just don't have jam, shabam and bar. Yep. <laughs> the dance programs yep. or, or tongue. But I'm only regularly teaching pump, RPM and, and body balance. So I regularly teach the three okay. just yep. because... I can't keep that much choreography in my head. Yeah, I've got a full time job. I understand that. Lot. Yep. But then when it's club launch or marketing events, I'll, I'll bang out a combat or I'll, or I'll do a, a trip or something like that just yep. for fun. Yep. Yeah. Love that. Hey, tell me the first ever class you taught. The first, it was obviously pump, I'm going to assume. Yeah. How did it go? Well, I want to say the first class I taught would have been a launch class because I remember it was the, the, the five of us. So three on stage, two either side of the stage facing the room, and yep. then we kind of rotated through. So yeah, me, Bobby, Terry, and then the other two. Um, and, I, and I've actually got some video footage of it, which, which because it was a Gold's Gym and they, and they filmed it and clipped yeah. it and I watched it back. And I don't remember anything about the class. I, it was it was just a blur. Like now I, I, I can only remember it, I think, because I've got the video the footage. Video, you know, yeah. and, like, yep. and I was wearing the black Nike shocks. I had these tiny short running <laughs> shorts on. And back then the, the vests were a little bit baggy. So we used to tie them in a knot around yeah. the back to make them a little bit more snug, you know, Steve Renata <laughs> yeah. style. Pete, Pete would have told you about that. Yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and then and then of course, you know, I, I I drank from the Kool Aid, so I shaved my legs. I had a fake tan. I had a bit yep. of baby oil on. You know, <laughs> you just think you're Mike McSweeney. Do you know what I mean? Everyone wants to be Mike McSweeney. Did back you then. did you have a bandana or was it a hat backwards? I didn't do that. No, I no? didn't do that. No, that was one thing. I, did. I just had sh real short hair, but I had the yep. uh, I had the wristbands, like a red wristband on one arm, and then a black and a white wristband on the other. Arm. Yep. <laughs> and a small wristband that comes up near the bicep yeah. it's it just tragic <laughs> what i do remember is that it's just my teaching style like it was i don't know if it was because i was in the usa and, that, and that's how i was trained but it was very cheesy it was it was you know lots of cheesy stuff over the top motivation you know too many words it was rhyming things and just you know it, it was it, how it was back then it was how it was, yeah. yeah. It, it just kind of—it wasn't training; it was yep. entertainment. You yeah, know, and, and we were having was, a whole lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of that stuff I'd, I'd never say now because you just yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're you're young and naive, and you're doing you you're doing your best, and you're finding your feet. And, yes. You know, you're, yeah. Part of you feels really cool because you're on stage teaching, and then part of you feels like I hope I don't do something stupid in front of all these people and embarrass myself. So yes. You're, you're awkward. Yeah. There's a level of awkwardness there, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was interesting because I said that I got sent that picture of my first module training. There's only eight people on it, and it was a club launching, so everyone on the training was brand brand new. Yep. But a couple of the girls they, they messaged me on, on on Facebook and said, "Oh, we never even knew it was your first training. Like it was really good," and which I thought was a nice thing to say because because I'm sure it wasn't great. Yeah. It's just that <laughs> training content is so well put together and and, and yeah. the, the structure of the days. It's it's like if you just learn the content and deliver it an average level people are going to love the training it's going to be good training yeah. you know and if yeah. you're able to put a bit of spice into it and, and make it a bit you know more memorable then then you're going to be a great trainer yeah. um, they so obviously 
work with. They obviously saw something in you, otherwise they wouldn't have said to you, hey, come on, jump on board and be a trainer. You know, you've obviously got a skill set that is what they were looking for, but obviously that you you know you've got it now. But back then you might not have even realised you had it. But as you said, when Terry tapped you on the shoulder, you know, hey, let's go in there, let's do this training, she would have seen something in you and your personality as well to go, you know what, I reckon this guy's got something that we can hone in on here. So from me to you, well done, and I think it's been brilliant you know, that, that, to know that that uh, that story, but also the fact that they chose you or they 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 trained you um, to be a trainer as well. I think he's brilliant. That's uh, yeah, hats off, man. That's that's awesome. Thank you, man. Yeah, I think like I'm, I guess there's got to be some sort of talent in there. Like you know, not not that you're a special individual, but whatever some skill sets you've got yeah. from how you were brought up <clears throat> is you've got to have that it's that nature nurture debate isn't it so yes. there's there's some in there that's natural and, and, and i put that back to you know I, I, I grew up in a pub so mum and dad owned a pub back in the uk when i was a kid and so i was passed around strangers every day all day you know so yep. i'm quite social and i'm quite comfortable in in uncomfortable environments and being yep. around different people and yeah. you know, i can sort of hold them in that space so maybe that upbringing lent me to be comfortable in this space i don't know so yep. yeah but but what it is is it's definitely that nurture so so, so i I always tell the story of, you know, Terry having this butterfly effect on me and then Mike McSweeney, Mike LaPlaca and, and Natalie, my trainers. So there's these three events that happened. There's the community of five people at Gold's Gym that we were together. So yep. it's, it wasn't about Les Mills. It wasn't about body pump. It was about five human beings yeah. looking after each other, wanting to be good at something, yep. you know, taking care of members in the gym, you know, going for dinner afterwards, having drinks, all that That's sort awesome. of social. Yeah. So, so if I didn't have those key experiences early doors, it, it's, it's kind of like joining a gym, you know, in those first 21 days of joining a gym, if you don't form that habit, yeah. you know, it comes to February and you've cancelled you've gone. and left. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to have some formative things in those early years. And, and that's what I really push all the time when I deliver trainings around, you know, having those social connections, having those mentors and coaches. I was really lucky. So, so, so Kathy Spencer was, was, was a, a great trainer and mentor. That boot camp we went to, you know, I learned so much and I can still hear myself when I do trainings now saying things that they said to me, yeah. doing drills that they did. I'm saying things that Terry said to me. I'm saying things that I heard my other yep. trainers say. So I just feel like I'm a sum of the parts of the people that I've been lucky enough to have interactions with along the way. Yeah. You know, and, and all I'm kind of doing is sharing those things myself to the people that I'm influencing and impacting and hoping that they get the same feeling from it and they want to then, you know, train and develop other people because because that feeling you get when you've helped someone else and, and, and you can see it's had a, an impact on them, yep. you know, it, it's, you, you, I mean, you know, you, yeah. you, it's like, you know, children, you know, your, yeah. your child starts to walk for the first time. I imagine that's an amazing moment. You're like, whoa, you know, yeah. you might not yep. have actually had that much influence in it, but you, you were there and you, you were, a couple yes. of things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And that's what I feel like. I don't, I don't have my own children, but I feel like, you know, along the way, there's a couple of people that yeah. might've helped and, and that's, it's way more satisfying than being on stage yourself. You yeah. Know? So back in back in 2010, 2011, I was an uh, um, indoor cycle master trainer for Fitness Network here in Australia. And same thing, you know, it was a two-day course, two-day indoor cycling course. We'd uh, get the guys up, you know, to me it was just back then, I, the thing I'd get across then was it's just having a go. Just get up and have a go. You know, at the end of the day, the end of Sunday, you're all going to get up and you're going to present a track. And to see those people at the end of that module after those two full days get up yeah. and nail it, and you sit there like it's like that, that proud parent moment of going, well done, you know. Yeah. yeah, some you had to give some feedback to. They weren't quite there, but you know, I'd say a good probably ninety to ninety five percent of them actually nail it and know that you've been able to help them, knowing that they're going to be able to go out into clubs as you said earlier and help more people was phenomenal. That that experience and just that that uh, moment that you shared with that person when they got it to go, you know, yeah, yeah, that's that's what this is about making a difference that's exactly what you say mate and it's i suppose there's, there's different names for it you know some people call it the butterfly effect or the ripple effect or yep. you know there's there's d different terms that people use but essentially it's the same thing we're, we're just using group fitness as our vehicle yes to help positively impact other people's lives yeah. you know i'd be the same if i was working in starbucks you know i'd, yeah. I'd be you come up for a coffee i'd be oh hey man how's your day what are you yeah. doing i like your shirt you yeah. know I'd, I'd, I'd that's just what i do it yeah it just happens to be in a group fitness room and and i recently Rewatched it like I love jumping on TED.com and watching yes. the clips of people, and I get so yeah. inspired. I've got about five or six that I talk about a lot. And there's one Benjamin uh, Zander, and and he's um he's actually a professional conductor, really famous conductor, and he, he's a classical music teacher. And he, he delivers this talk, so he uses classical music as his vehicle to deliver the talk. 
Um, he, and he's got loads of great one-liners and quips and jokes. He, he's he's just he's just superb. You can watch him for hours. But anyway, he he comes up with this thing where he ultimately realised that his job is to realise potential in other people, yep. and then that's what he boils it down to. It's it's to realise potential and possibilities in other people. You know, he's just using classical music because that's what he's passionate about. I'm using health and fitness because that's yeah. what I'm passionate about. Yep. And and then his ending comment was around you know the way he knows if he's achieving that or not is by looking at people's eyes yep. and if they've got shiny sparkly eyes he's doing his job right yep. and he's, then that begs the question of if you don't have sparkly eyes in front of you you get to ask yourself the question who are you being to prevent these people from shining and sparkling you know so if wow. there's room in front of you then they're not lining yeah. up sparkling what are you doing what are you yeah that's your responsibility and that blew my mind because it essentially you know if you're distilling down what we do Everything to me comes down to that sentence. Yeah, that is it. totally. Whether it's Zumba, totally. boxing, Pilates, spinning, yeah, RPM, whatever you know. And and I think that's years ago when I first watched saw, saw that clip. That that's something that really changed my perspective about being more outwardly focused about what I do. Yeah, and less inwardly focused. Like you've got to be inwardly focused at the start because you've got to be obsessed and yep. you've got to put in a shit ton of work to get yep. good at this craft. Yeah, like you have to be. And, and if you want to be successful you've got to be a little bit selfish and a little a little bit of ego you know a little bit of push and drive and sacrifice some things but but then you get to this place where you know you've mastered your craft and you've got a bit of profile and, and then you can use that to help more people you know, yeah. it's not about you your power isn't your power it's how you make other people powerful yeah um, yeah and that, and that clip just really changed my perspective and, and i try and instill that when i train instructors now of them realizing that it, it's not that big a deal if you don't say brace the core and lift the chest. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what, what's a big deal is how that person in the room feels. And I, and I know Lee Smith said exactly the same thing, you know, and, and, and me and Lee's the same as you and Lee. Like, we, we talk for hours endlessly about stuff and yep. deep, hard stuff, you know, yep. Yep. And in this group fitness world. And, and we have sleepless nights about stuff around yep. this, and, you know, and we're, we're constantly thinking about how we can do it and, and do it better. And, and, then, and that's the big thing about how you're making those people in front of you feel. Yeah. And teaching from that outward focus of it, it is a, it's completely about them. You are serving those people in yeah. front of you. Yeah. You know, and your job is to make their eyes spark and shine. Yeah. And, you know, engage, educate, entertain, and ultimately inspire. This is the Group X Podcast. Mate, I appreciate that. That's uh, anyone that's listening, jump on and go and have a look for that that video. I'm assuming it's on. It'll be on exactly, YouTube somewhere. Yeah. And yeah, jump on and have a look. I'm I'm definitely going to do it later on this afternoon and and have a tune in. So, mate, thank you. Hey, I want to ask you a question about what happened. How did you move out of the US? Where did you go to from the US? Where was your next stop? Yes, yeah, so that was kind of a forced move in a way. So that was that was right around the the, the split of Les Mills and, and and body training systems. So. You know, I think in the early days, Les Mills kind of franchised out quite big and, and got the agencies to, to, to buy the products and, and, and run the business, you know, which was a smart move to get out there in more countries. Yeah. And as time went on, it was like, OK, to, to maintain quality control, we need to centrally run this thing. So little by little, they started getting the agencies back and, and running them from sort of from the, the central location. So that was right around that time. So that would have been two, 2004, I think, um, where the Les Mills and BTS were splitting so much. So so my visa i either had to stay with the step company and go with them and do what's now mossa yep or if i wanted to stay les mills you know i'd, I'd, I'd have because there wasn't a full-time role with les mills i had to leave come back to the uk um so so that's that's the choice i made i came back to the uk um and, and what happened which was which was really kind was was kathy spencer just put in a phone call and it was actually to pete manuel yep. so pete and you know we're running it back back then in the day in the uk um fit, fit pro uh, put in a phone call and said hey we've got this dude coming back to england matt you know could, any chance you can have a look at him for the team and pete's like yeah sure and so so, so lucky i had a, a excellent a, a, a yeah you know because obviously those two have been close for many years um so it meant i could i could sort of move back to the uk and still be a lesmos trainer on the team there um and then so i was in the uk for a little while um got 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 that that phone call that so many of us would love to have around would you like to come to new zealand and do a filming brilliant and that was that was 2008 so i did did body pump 63 in 2008 um and then when i was there I, I didn't sort of consciously do networking but i kind of realized now that what i did was i did as much sort of research and development as i could to understand new zealand and les mills and what's going yeah. on and i must have put the word out that i want to live here and move here and i this is where i want to be i love this i want to be closer to the source yeah uh, and back then a, a french lady called vanessa jodar she was yes. like a coach 
yeah. she was coaching body pump teams. So we saw her every day. She did feedback and everything. Um, and, and I guess we've got a good relationship and, and, and she sort of liked me and what I did. And, and she's close friends with a woman called Jackie Griffin, who is the, the manager of Les Mills in New Lynn, which is West Auckland. Yeah. Um, and they needed a group fitness manager. So I'm, I'm, I'm in London working, get a phone call and it's, you know, would you, would you like to apply for the role of GFM in Auckland, New Zealand? And so, this, so she put in a, a reference for me and, and the funny thing, about it, and, and, and Jackie Griffin and, and Jackie's an, another one that just is so inspirational in, in, in my life. And I'm always forever grateful for the, you know, the impact she's had on me. And, and, and I'm quoting tons of stuff when I'm training people that she said to me, yeah, you know, cause yeah. she's so awesome. Yeah. But, but, uh, I remember we, we were trying to dial in a phone interview and we couldn't quite get the times right. And anyway, the times worked out. The only time that she could do, she was doing a fitting for a dress because she was going to a wedding that weekend. So she's half naked in the changing room, change. putting her dress, talking to me on the phone, doing the interview to get the job as group fitness manager at Les Mills. <laughs> That's brilliant. Oh, man. And yeah, we, we laugh about that because I had no idea. She didn't tell me the time, but she told me afterwards. Yeah. Because obviously... It, She's being professional. Yeah. <laughs> Little do you know, I'm half naked with my ass hanging out the door, trying to talk on the phone with one shoe on. <laughs> That's the but best that, interview like, ever. <laughs> that's kind of an insight into what my next four years was like, because then I, you know, I, got the, I actually got, um, I was invited to do, it was the Lesmos Global Summit, so all us trainers were going to Auckland. Yep. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, Body Pump 63, sorry, was 2007. Yep. The Global Summit was 2008, so... I went there to film 66 and then just stayed there for the job afterwards. Yep. So I just moved there and did the Global Brilliant. Summit. And so before so you yeah. before you go any further on that, I want to ask you, when you got the phone call, when they rang you and said, hey, would you be interested? Take me back to that if you can, if you can yeah, remember. I, How was I that? I was. I just can't remember what part. So I was in London and I know I was under a bridge. And it was, it was a big brick bridge somewhere. And it would have been, it's probably near Cannon Street because I was teaching at the gym there. Um and, and it was Sean, Sean Egan phoned me. So he was, he was like head trainer at the time back in the UK. And, and, and that's another funny story. So, so when I got back to the UK, it was the Loughborough event. So when I first flew from America, going back to the UK, that weekend was a Loughborough event. And I went straight to that event. What's, and what's that? So, 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 sorry, Loughborough is, is the big sports university in the UK. Okay. It's like now we do the Lesmos Live. Yes. We used to have Lesmos Lives, but it was, it was like a super quarterly back okay. then. Okay, okay. Yep. So you, you're on the big basketball court, you know, they put up the speakers. The whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 300 people doing the class. Yeah, so it was yep. a big two-day event. Um, so I wasn't presenting or anything. I was just there, there to sort of meet the team and be part of it and immerse myself. But yep. I guess poor, poor old Sean got roomed with me, you know, so he would have had a room on his own, but it's some some English kids coming over and stuff. <laughs> And I remember when I met him, like, the, like you know, Sean, the dude's in great shape, you know, Sean Egan, he was, he was a bit of a legend back then. So it was, it was another great experience of learning, you know, from someone, you know, you're, you're standing yes. on the shoulders of all these people that have been before you. So, yeah, yeah but, it's, but he was the, he was the guy that phoned me. And, um, and, it, and it's strange because it, it's something that, yes, you'd love to do and you want, you just don't think you'll get. Yep. So it's a really dark quality. It's a really strange kind of feeling. And, and of course, you're excited. You're like, holy shit, wow. And then straight away, you're like, oh, shit, I better get in shape. I better be <laughs> learning to kick better. You know, I'm, I'm going to be represented in the UK. You know, So you, you suddenly get nervous and think of all the things you've got to do gotta to make do. sure you're good yeah. you get there. Yep. I'm, I'm sure some people are super comfortable in their skin and they might have just gone, oh, yeah, that's great. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yep. But it was a bolt out of the blue for me. Totally you know, didn't think it was it was on the cards. Yeah. And, and I still don't know why. I mean, I, I think it, it's possibly because back then when we had the Euro Summits, so, you know, the, the, the European trainers get together and we yes. have events, really yep. cool places that, the, that I got to present at a Euro Summit. Yep. You know? And so what happens then is, is obviously LMI are at the summit. So Glenn's there. So somewhere in there, Glenn might have seen me present and thought, yes. oh, he's all right. We need someone from the UK. Yep. And then Sean might have put my name forward or the, or the UK office team are like, we, you know, we've got the chance to send someone. So the, the, the sort of system of how presenters are chosen is sort of changes over the years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, so I still don't really know why it was me. You know, they, 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 like, like Darren had been sent, Wayne Pegg had been sent. Like before me, all the top UK guys had already gone and done filmings. So it, I might have just been lucky that, yep. you know, when it's Team UK's turn again, I was just there at the right time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, mean, I remember standing under the brick arches and, and just it was total shock. Yeah. <laughs> and then and I'm like, wow, yeah. And yeah. then straight away it was, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the sort of guy that puts my hand down to my belly and pinches it and goes, yes, shit, yes, I'm yes, a, yeah. I better get straight. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally, it's just ridiculous, totally insecure and stupid, but yep. 
you, it's, you, yeah. You are. Yeah. <laughs> Who was the first person you told? Well, that's a good question. Do you know what? I honestly don't know, but I would I would wager it was my mum. Yep. Yeah, I, w- I would wager it was my mum, but I, I can't honestly say that I know the answer to that. Yeah. Which is a shame, really, because that is like in the world of coaching that is just a, a moment yeah it's, it's just that, that moment of you know what you just had this amazing news who'd yeah. you find, who'd you call who'd you call first because i look i know now now it'd be rach if anything major happens i'm like on the phone to rach yeah. going hey you, yeah. you know but before yeah. rach it was as you said your mum that was my mum yeah. you know yeah i'm italian yeah. my, my, my mama's boy no matter what <laughs> you know it would be if something yeah. big went down Ring mum. Mum and dad always have always done speakerphone to me, so I'm chatting to both of them at the same time. But <laughs> so it'd be both of them. But yeah, I just thought I'd ask that one. Throw that one at you. Yeah, yeah. I'll be pretty confident that it wasn't a quick phone call. I'm pretty confident that there was a an amount of time, like it might have been yeah. thirty minutes, forty minutes, or something. Yeah. Like that. But I know I was still processing for a little while. Yeah. You know, and then I, I can see myself walking around so near the water and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of excellent. In a little bit. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. How was how was filming? How was the lead up to that filming, and and how was that experience for you? Tell tell us a bit about that. It was re- it was really cool for me because I was really keen to make it um, like not just about the class, you know, because because obviously that was the, the reason you're going. It's huge, but it's also you're going to New Zealand. I yep. mean, come on, you go you go to this amazing country with you know this beautiful country, so much history and legacy, and a different culture and different people and. And so, I, and I had a girlfriend at the time, a girl called Emma. And so we, we, we both went. So what happened was, is I went and did the, 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 the week filming, you know, seven days. And then we had a holiday after for another seven days and toured New Zealand or 10 nice. days. Toured New Zealand and did, and, and, and that's when I got my, my New Zealand tattoo. And, you know, and so I, I wanted it to be a bit of a cultural experience. Yep. And then that was the thing. So, so filming week was great because it was just me, Glenn and Susan. And, you know, I was really lucky that it was just the three of us. Um, and then Vanessa was the coach. And and I just love all those people. They're, they're great people, yeah. really skilled at what they do. They've got, you know, they're, they're, there's authenticity there. They, you know, they're real people, and, and there's no fluff, and they, they care about you. But they'll tell you like it is, you know. Yep. Um, and it, and it was big for me to meet Susan because she she she's a you know big time role model of mine, and 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 she was she didn't disappoint. You know, she's like in your face, hardcore. Yep. But the jokes are straight off the bat. You know, yep. it's just we formed a great relationship. And and then Glenn was great coaching. You know, helping you be better with the music and how he yeah. was pumped delivered and giving you some. You know, giving you the confidence that you can stand up and do it. So that so that week was really good because we, we taught a lot of classes back then. Like you got smashed. It was two classes a day, then filming feedback. Um, and so you so during the middle of the week, you, you get quite battered. You yep. psychologically you're quite exhausted. You're taking a lot of feedback. But you know, you, you you've got Glenn who's like, "No, mate, you're doing great. I just want you to do this, this, and this. Yep. A real clear direction." You know, Susan's doing the you know what would now be described as bullying, but at the yep. time it was like banter. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> And then, and then Vanessa had the look of how the final product needed to be in market. So she's giving yep. you the business angle and coaching and developing. So, you know, and you, you meet Jackie for the first time, Philip, and then there's the big welcome meeting. You do all the Hongi, you get your Greenstone. And yep. it's a hell of an event. It's really, really cool. And to have the holiday, you know, afterwards where I did, yeah. did some, you know, New Zealand cultural stuff and learned yep. more about the country. And, and that's why I really fell in love with it and thought, yeah, this is this is somewhere I'd love to be, you know, not, not just because of the Les Mills world, but... Yeah. The, the people and, and even, even you know the indigenous people the maori culture and the polynesians and, and just all that cool stuff it's yeah it's just so different from england you yeah know? yeah and very I, true I it, yeah. very true yeah. yeah the uh so you, you mentioned you were you were a group fit, a group x manager i like to call a group x manager not group fitness manager that's just yeah, yeah. yeah group x show we got it i stay on brand with that <laughs> uh group x manager at uh les mills new lynn how was that yeah. how was that as a club working working there Oh, fantastic. I, I, I still think it's probably the, if, if, if I'm looking back over my career, you know, that, that sort of four year span, it was, I just grew and developed so much as a person, mostly because of Jackie Griffin yep. taking under a wing and, and teaching me stuff. And, and again, it's, it's similar to like how Susan was on the filming. Like it's, it's that very sort of old school Kiwi way, which is very direct, but there, there's humor in there and there's yep. a bit of, a, a bit of banter and edgy and you, you kind of get it, you're getting a bit of ribbing but it's from love. It's from care, yes. you know, and, and if they're not doing that to you, then you, you're not important enough. Yeah. To them. Yeah. When you are getting yeah. stuff, you, you know, you're important, but yeah. you know, she was like a mother, a best friend, a teacher, yep. a coach, a mentor. And, and so I really felt at home there. And, and, and what she's done a great job of at, at New Lynn is, is it's community. Yep. And I always come back to this word community. And when I look at the positive times in my life or what I'm trying to create, 
that's exactly what it is. You know, those, those shiny eyes, realizing potential in others. Yeah. And it is a family there, you know, and, and, and I mentioned that the Maoris and the Polynesians, because out West Auckland, it's, it's heavily populated and, and they just took me as their son. You know, I was invited to barbecues, people's houses, I was getting awesome. gifts, you know, you were family. Yep. And, and, and there's a different feel to the city gym. You know, New Lynn is really community family based. Yep. Um, a lot of great instructors have gone through there. Um, the class numbers are always good. Like historically, they've got great class attendance. They've got, you know, great group fitness managers. Amy Styles was there. Yep. T was there. You know, and so they just had this culture of people coming through that, you know, passed on the legacy to the to the next generation. Yeah. And and, and when it came time to leave, it, it was it was it was really hard. But um, I, I always remember they they they, they honoured me by doing a they gave me some, you know this this book and everyone signed it. There's loads of pictures in it and and, and a green stone. But but they did a, a hacker for me, and and I don't know if you know much about the you know the New Zealand culture and that, but it's that's a real honour because you you can't just do that for any random person any time of the you know yep. any day of the week you know it's it's for a real pivotal moment you know, it's yeah. and, funerals and, and really honoring people um and for me to be a white you know a skinny white english man you know to have the the these you know true indigenous new zealanders you know the islanders and the pacific islanders and maoris and they did this ha hacker for me to honor me it was really powerful i remember they, they brought me down for my last combat class and, and they were like walking me down the stairs of new lynn but it was they were walking me really slow and i was like why are they doing like, what? what's going on here yeah and of course it was because everyone was getting ready down at the front Jam. desk yeah you know and I, I walked around the corner and saw and, and it was you know and it's people now that you know it's it's Vili and Karan. so this 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 group that are now you know the rock stars of les mills you know yeah. this was the start of their journey and and, and he led it and obviously you know and he's, he's in incredible shape fit athletic good looking boy and he was at the front and, and, and i just broke down in tears it was just such an emotional moment and, and i remember jackie saying to me like what you need to understand matt is that they had to get permission to, to do this. To do thing. this, yeah. It's, you've got to get the ground. It's got to be sacred ground to do this thing. Wow. I mean, it's, it's not just a bunch of people getting together, doing a little dance to say goodbye. Yeah. You know, she's like, yeah. this is powerful. So that that really left me with, with an incredible, you know, it wasn't a, a sense of loss that I was leaving. It's this real incredible sense of th this meant something. Like this yep. time here meant something in my life. It meant something to other people. And, and I'll always carry that with me. So, yeah, the, t the time in New Lynn for me was is... Is, is just the number one it's paramount yeah. in my my career and and me as a person where did you go to after new lynn so that was in australia so i got a, a, a role as club manager in australia so club in club chain genesis so it's kind of like going from group fitness manager taking the challenge to then club manager you yep. know, the, it was kind of the next step so I'd, I'd actually applied for a couple of club manager roles in new zealand um and and, and i missed out because they've that they always had someone that had a bit more experience. Yep. You know, so two times. Yep. I think one time was, I think it was the Brudermark Club. Both times, actually, yeah, Brudermark Club. So someone came in that had more experience and was proven in that space. So I was like, well, I can't get a manager's role in New Zealand because I don't have the experience. Yes. And I and I and I only want to work at a Les Mills club. Yep. So I have to go overseas to get club manager experience. And, and you know, yep. the, the idea at the time was to then come back and get a, a club manager's job in in, in New Zealand. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so I went went to Aussie then. So I was in Melbourne, and I ended up being there for four and a half years. Um, and then obviously you still carry on the Lesnar's training stuff, you know, for, yes. for LMAP. Yep. So that was really cool that, that you know I got to stay on the team, and then, and then you know ended up being you know doing quite a bit of work for Lesnar's Asia Pacific. Um, and again, you, you're just around cool people, you know. Yeah. It's just it's, it's crazy. Even even a bad day at the office is better than a good day in many other jobs. <laughs> yeah, <no>? It's so <laughs> true. I use that one quite a fair bit. It is so true. It's a a bad day where you are now is a good day where you maybe come from before. So you, you know, it's always a step yes. forward. It's you know, never bagging out where you were before because that sounds like when I say that and people know that I've come from Les Mills working head office, that it was a bad day there. But no, things <laughs> things were different for me yeah. when I left. We left because of Leah and yeah, the circumstances were different. But no, it's true. You you. Yeah, it's it's. I haven't found a bad day in this industry. You know, I started yeah. in two thousand and three, and I'm yet to find anywhere that is that is crap, that is bad, that that makes you go, oh, why am I doing this? You know, no, I'm working for Body Bike now and and GM for Body Bike here in Australia, and even now with what we're doing, there's challenges, but I still appreciate every single day doing what I do because you look at the the end effect of what we do. Look at the people's lives we're touching, and whether it's me or whether it's someone I've sold a bike to that's then passing on expertise to somebody else. We're all still engaged in that way. And as you said right from the beginning, that is that's powerful. That's really powerful. This is the Group X podcast. 
I think you've, you've nailed it. It's, it's purpose, isn't it? That sense of purpose, which which gives us fulfillment. I think is that you know, as humans, we talk a lot about I want to be happy, you know, and so happy is banded around a lot, or successful, and blah blah blah. But but I don't think our role is to be happy all the time. You know, yeah. that, that, I don't think that is our role. Our role is purpose, and, and what you're saying there is where you see the effect of what you do. You know, and, and you might have seven and a half hours of a bad day, but at one moment you know you've done something that's had some positive impact on someone else yeah. or the business or the industry or, you know, and it, it can be a real tiny 10 second moment. It yep. might not even feel significant at the time, yep. but that's enough for you to go. Yep. Yeah, actually I've done something good today. And, and, yeah. and you know, it's, it's a sense of purpose. And, 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 and that's where, again, I, I sort of try and ground the people that I train in, in this, because this is the stuff that's going to keep them in the industry for a long time. Yep. You know, if, if your goal is just to be on a Lesnar's filming, you know, if, if there's, so there's 8,000 instructors in China, which, which there are. We've got 8,000 Lesmos instructors. 7,995 of them are going to be unhappy. Yeah. yeah. Because we have five on a filming, you know, yeah. that's just the way it is. If yes. that's your goal, yep. it ain't going to happen. So yep. you have to find your value, your place, yep. your purpose yep. in something else because you can't let it be in someone else's decision. Yeah. It has to be you knowing what you're doing, you know. Yeah. And I see this message all the time. I just saw it recently with, um, you know, Federer and Nadal. Yeah. You know, and even Djokovic, like these guys are talking like, hey, like Djokovic, it sucks that I can't go to America. Yep. But I can't make that decision. Someone else chooses it or not. Yeah. My belief is I don't want to be vaccinated. Fair yep. enough. We respect that. Yep. You have to be vaccinated to go to the USA. Okay, yep. that's the rules. Yep. He's not pissing and moaning and being depressed. He's yep. going, okay, that's what it is. Yep. That doesn't determine my happiness. Rafael Nadal, yes. you know, I'm injured. I, I miss tournaments. You know, That doesn't determine my happiness. I've got yep. a healthy family. I've got kids. You know, It's yep. the ability to play again tomorrow. That's what I yep. want to do. It's so yeah. th these guys at the top, the absolute elite of what they do, they found their happiness isn't in just winning trophies. Yeah. The happiness, that journey of their own self-discovery, their yeah. own challenges, their own development, and, and and their life, not just the thing they do as a profession. Yes, and, yeah. and I really try to follow that. You know, it's it's something that I've really grown into over the years because because just like any other Lesmos people, I've had many dark days where I feel like I'm not good enough, or I wasn't chosen for something, or yeah. someone else got the rule I didn't, and. Yeah. And you get insecure. You look at yourself and think, I'm yeah. not good enough. What? But then yeah. it's like, well, that's only one or two other people saying that. Like, if your whole self-evaluation is based on these two people, you're never going to be happy. Yeah. You know? So yeah. You've got, it's, you've got to find it's interesting you say that i remember chatting to someone just recently and i can't remember who it was for the life of me i wish i did but it was in regards to being a trainer and presenter now really it's only four times a year that you're actually presenting yeah four times a year yeah cool it's four times but hang on a second that that tuesday night class at 5 45 or 6 whatever time it may be those guys turn up for you week in week out they're there yeah yeah so that's where you really need to making sure you're hitting the mark not four times a year Four times a yeah. year, yeah, you've got to hit the mark and you can be, get excited about that and do all that, all of that. But every night you rock up to your class or every day you rock up to your class is when you've got to be on fire giving your absolute best because those people, they need you as much as everybody else and four times a year do, you know. And it's, it was interesting. I took away from what you were just saying then. It just sort of resonated with me. I was like, you know what, yeah, that's, that's powerful to, to have that effect on so many people. But at the same time, when you're doing the, the even the masterclass filming and that kind of stuff, and it's an amazing experience for you and, and a journey and going through all that kind of stuff, it really may only happen, you know, a handful or two handfuls yeah. of time. You know, yes, it's an experience, but what really counts is where you're teaching in and out on a regular basis, regular basis. Those guys that are coming because they love Mathrax and on pump on a Tuesday night at 5.30, they rock up because of that. They, you know, that's yeah. where you you've got to do your big ones. Yeah, they, they don't care if you're a training manager or if you've been on a DVD or if you've gone to Brazil and done a super coolly work. They don't care of any of that stuff. Yeah. It's, it's probably Lee Smith. I, I'm sure I've heard Lee say that hundreds of times, and yeah. I know Lee and I have discussed this around. You know, it's it's managing expectations of your team. So we have a competition here called the One, and and the idea is that it's, it's like the Voice or the X Factor. Yeah. You know, they all send in videos, and yeah. then we judge them, and they do some live competitions and. And it whittles down to a quarterfinal, semifinal, final, and then there's one winner. Yep. And that one winner becomes a, a Lesmos presenter for Lesmos China. Yep. And that's how it started. So, you know, back when I first got it in 2017, it was just a talent show to find some talent for trainers. But as the years progressed, I've, you know, just started to realize that the competition was bigger than that. And it wasn't something that I influenced. It was just something that I realized and then started to make sure that I pushed and supported. But it evolved and it just, again, it became community. So these instructors actually, although there was only one winner, they were supporting each other. 
you know, they were practicing behind the bike sheds, you know, yep. doing their body combat moves together. So when they then come on stage to teach, they were slick and sharp. Yep. They were talking about what T-shirts are we going to wear? Let's get the same outfits. You yeah. Know, supporting each other. So when, when Instructor A was presenting, Instructor B and C were shadowing, you know, to support yep. them and give them... And, yep. and I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is camaraderie. This is community. This is teamwork. This is, you know, this is what used to be, you know, you know, one tribe, but then we changed yep. it to United. This, this is what the value is. Yes. And this is just good people being good people. And, and I love to see that. And I thought, that's what we need to promote. And then also it was around the same thing. 800 people enter, only one can win. Yep. So we have 799 unhappy people. Yeah. And that's my fault because I've done this competition and yep. said, yes, yeah, you're a winner. Yeah. It's like, well, no, what it's going to be is this is going to be an integral part of your instructor journey. So yep. we want to help coach you to, to being a master of your craft. Yes. You know, we want you to be Roger Federer of yep. Body Pump. Yeah. Yeah. So it's let's give you some skills. So then we just put in some more education sessions, some more learning. You know, I've got some PPTs and I'm doing some online sessions, how to present to camera, how to use your voice better, how to interact and engage. You know, yes, yeah, some skills around teaching, but also some skills around stage presence and showmanship and yeah. all these skills that, you know, you pick up through experience. And so now what's going to happen is you enter the competition. Yes, you challenge yourself with the videos and the feedback and being on stage. So you're going to be better. Your scripts in your tracks, you're getting in front of the mirror. You know, you're coming to this coaching session. When you go back to your club, you're going to deliver a more professional, high quality service to your yeah. members, without yeah. doubt. But now it's about you being better, not you winning. Yes. Because 799 of you aren't going to win. Yeah. But, but you're going to be better. Of you are yeah. Going to be better. Yeah. And that's where the power comes from. And, and exactly like you said, around you're teaching that Tuesday night class every single week. You know, this is where you make an impact because, and, and, and another story that I, that I tell that which is the reason I, I talk so passionately about this stuff and, and why I know it is what it's about. You know, it's, it's not about chest up, abs on, two, two, yep. you know, yep. this is what it's about, what, what, regardless of what you're teaching. When, when I was in, in, in New Lynn, I, I taught the Tuesday night 5.30 combat class. Um, and, there was a, and there was a guy that came in one time and he, and he came in, he was in the back corner and he was a quite a heavy set Maori guy, Polynesian, wore a big baggy t-shirt, you know, and, and then he, you could see that he was a bit shy and not sure. He looked like it was his first time. And all I did was go up and say hello. You know, the same thing any other instructor would do. Just say hello. And his name was Oni. I was like, oh, yeah, it's his first time. I was like, oh, cool. So I'm in combat teaching the warm-up. All good back there, Oni? Yeah, cheers, bro. You know, just dropped his name a couple of times, checking in. And then at the end of class, went over. How was it? He goes, oh, man, yeah, that was cool. Thanks. You know, but the, the very humble, you know, yep. people. And it's very, yeah. very low-key. Yeah. Um, and then he came back again, came back again. And he was, he was a regular. And what I then found out was he's actually the husband of a girl called Rebecca, who's the front row. So Rebecca was in class every week, front row. Her and her girls, there was a couple of, like, three yep. or four of them that all came. And they were they wore the gloves, the wraps, all yeah. the gear, like, yeah. that. <laughs> hey, that's his wife. So, you know, she'd been knocking on him to come to body combat, and he's like, oh, I don't know. He ends up coming. Anyway, so it, was, it, it must have been, a, it was around a year later, because the reason I remember it was around a year is because he, he wrote me a letter in a card, and he gave it to me. And what he did is he outlined this story around how he had some issues going on in his life. He was a little bit unhappy, things like anxiety, depression, very heavily overweight, health issues, you know. And, and what had happened is he, it actually ended up losing almost 50 kilos in this in this Holy time shit. span. He, he wanted to get to 100 kilos, like he was a yep. really big guy. Yep. He wanted to get down. And he wrote in this letter and he said, you, you won't to know this, but, you know, because you came up and said hello to me and made me feel welcome, I felt comfortable coming back. That's and he had the support awesome. of his wife that wanted him to come. And, and, and to me, saying hello to him is, is just what I do. Yep. It's, it's not a special skill. It's yeah. not a superpower. I yeah. don't want any accolades. Yep. I just did what I would encourage everyone to just do as being a good person. But it's the butterfly effect. Yep. Because to him, that was a huge difference. To me, I'm just saying hello to another person. Yeah. Someone knew, hey, how are you doing? But to him, that was the big difference that helped. It wasn't the thing that made the difference. It was a contributing factor. Yep. Another contributing factor was his wife and his support team, his family and his friends. Another contributing factor is the gym at New Lynn is very welcoming. The reception girls always say hello. They always remember your name. Yep. Another factor is combat's a cool program. Like, yep. you know, back then the old school stuff, they loved it, you know. And yeah. so people would come to class and they're singing the tunes and doing the moves. And, yep. you know, so the whole environment just helped support this guy in this thing. And I remember when I showed that letter to Jackie and, and we both welled up. It was like, wow, this is huge because this is what it's all about. Yeah. And what's even cooler is that his son started coming to class, Jonah. And so now you've got the whole family coming. Yeah. Now, Jonah ended up, similar situation, a little bit overweight, started to get in good shape. Um, and I was like, hey, man, actually, you should be an instructor. And so we put Jonah on a training, and I actually did his initial training for body combat. Brilliant. And then 
Joanna becomes a presenter for Little Mills New Zealand. So he's now doing some workshops. Excellent. So like, wow, this, this journey of the family yeah. is incredible. You know, they're all supporting each other, helping each other. They love health and fitness. They love Lesmo's new Lynn. They love yep. Lesmo's body combat. Um, and then, of course, Joanna gets married. Joanna has a son. Yep. He's got a son at Andorra, I think, now, too. Yep. Um, so he's then going to spread that influence of in health and fitness yeah. to his children. Yep. And you're like, wow, this is huge because this is what it's about. Now, at no point has anything like ostentatious happened. Yeah. Anything but it's the butterfly yeah. effect. It's, yeah. it's Terry tapping me on the shoulder. Yeah. It's Matt saying, hello, Oni, how are you doing? It's nothing. Yeah. But it makes a huge impact. Yeah. And so this is why I'm really big when I'm training instructors and trying to influence and inspire people and, and anyone listening now. It's like, that's your impact. Yeah. Standing in line at Starbucks, you talk to someone behind you about fitness. You could change their life right then. <laughs> Your next class, it might not just be a class for someone. It yep. might be a, a huge moment. And we don't need to dive into what someone's got in their life. It's the reason why they're there, why they're unhappy, why they're yep. upset, and yep. relationships yep. at home, whatever. But you might just put your arm around someone and go, hey, good to see you today. Yeah. And that could be the thing. Yeah. You know, and what a gift that is. What a gift that we have got that that can happen. And we can do that every single day. We might do that yeah. to someone every single day. Yeah, you, so, you. I love hearing that. Yesterday morning, I went to the post office. Yeah, had to drop something off for, for a body bike. I think it was actually, weirdly enough, a box of saddles going to New Lynn, Les Mills New Lynn. We, like, no, I'm not bullshitting. This is fair income. There was 10 saddles that were going to New Lynn. I've still got the, the, the invoice next to me. I believe <laughs> and yeah. and heading, back, heading back out of the post office, walking to the car, it was near a car wash place. And there's this young kid that's in there, you know, wiping the windows, doing all the window cleaning stuff. And he just looked looked unhappy for some reason, like he was he was stressed or whatever it is. And I just looked up at him and glanced and got his eye contact with him and said, mate, you're doing a great job. He just, he just smiled. He just, wow, yeah. you know, I just, it was like, I just, I had that moment of going to him, dude, you know what? You're doing a fucking brilliant job. Nice. I didn't know what else was going on in his life or anything like that, but it was just that moment. And it's, it, as you've just said, I, I relate it to that because he could have gone on having a bloody amazing day from just a couple of simple words I said that... I wasn't, I didn't want anything from that. I didn't try and get anything from that. It was just, dude, you know what? You're doing okay. Yeah. What, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. And it's, yeah, I love that. But thank you for sharing that as well, mate. Because that is, I think a lot of people don't realise the power that we really have by doing what we do, those little things that we do every day. Yeah. And I think probably for the most part, we, 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 we never get to know. So, so yeah. I was lucky in the sense that Oni wrote me that letter and yeah. gave me a card. Yeah. You know, but but that whole year leading up to that, I didn't know. Yeah. It was just coming regular. So, so so again, there's an, an, another great TED talk. Um, it's called Everyday Leadership. I forget the man's name. Um, but Everyday Leadership, and he, he tells this lollipop story about the, the short version is he gives a lollipop to a girl that's waiting in line. Um, he just says hello to her. But the, the line is to register for college. But she's about to go, shit, I can't do this. I'm too stressed out. I'm not good enough for college. I'm going to leave. And just at the time, he box up and gives her this lolly. And she ends up staying and chatting to him and then signs up for the course. Yep. And then, obviously, she then does a three, four years of college. And her final speech, when she says, thank you, I've graduated, she thanks this guy and says, hey, you didn't know this, but if it wasn't for you giving me that lollipop, I never would have done college. So thank yep. you. So he had three years of knowing nothing. Yeah. And then it's like, holy shit, I, oh. I changed her entire life yeah. by that one moment. Yeah. And um. And, that, and that's that's exactly what what this stuff is yeah. you know that everyday leadership that lollipop moment that butterfly effect and all we want is we just want more of that yep. you know and and when i'm trying to train instructors in this business or, or motivate people and inspire them i look at what's the again what's the thing that you're doing that's stopping you doing that because i don't believe anyone in this industry doesn't do that yeah it doesn't want to we all do it yeah naturally we all love to make people feel happy feel better we talk to people but the thing that stops us doing it is i'm worried about my choreography is my technique good yep. i'm doing the new launch i'm stressing will i get chosen for a dvd i want to be a trainer i'm not a trainer all the shit that we put in our head prevents us from being our real real self yeah. just natural yep. cool person that's good and, and that's what i try and get across that ultimately that's what it is when we boil it down to if you come from that place you know of just being a good person for the people in the room. Yep. Treat it like that in your front room. You know, you're the host of a party. Yeah. They're all in your front room for an hour. Yeah. You're gonna you, you're gonna be all right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're gonna do a great job. People are gonna love you for it. They're gonna want to keep coming back. Yes, you can work on your skills. Yep. 
you know, better technique, better coaching, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But really, you've got to be present and, and, and allow yourself to do this thing that you're great at. Yeah. And get those barriers out of the way. So it's, yeah. it's almost like that Michelangelo thing about sculpting David. You know, he gets yeah. a bit of clay. He yeah. takes away everything that isn't Mike David, you know. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's what I try and come from that angle. Whereas I used to come from the angle of, you've got to know your choreography 100%. You've got to really yeah. nail your technique. You've got to, t- you know, better yeah. timing. You need to, your layer two coaching is not there. You need to find external coaching cues. You've got, you know, and it's, all that stuff is relevant, of course. Yep. But that's not what changed, you know, that yeah. isn't what changed on his life. That yes. isn't what changed my life. That's yeah. not what changed your life, you know. Yeah, yeah. And when we can tap into that, we've all got the ability to do that. Yeah. You know, all of us. It's in there, yeah. This is the Group X Podcast. So, mate, where, you, you mentioned you're at uh, in a club in Melbourne. Where are you now? Mm. Where, where, where are you in the world right now? Shanghai, China. Okay, yeah. and how? I mean, I'm going to say, how did you get there? Now I know it was an aeroplane. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty good switched on with that. I know it was an aeroplane. <laughs> what took you to China? How did you? Yeah, tell us about that. I feel, I feel like as, I, as we're sort of reminiscing here. You know, and I keep telling these stories that all seem to be a little bit chance. Do you know what I mean? Like yep. each one has been like I haven't sort of sat down and done like my five year plan and you yep. know and sculpted out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be here. I'm going to, do people it's still do awesome. that? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pinball wizard, you know, bounce around. Yep. I've been very lucky. Um, so again, this was this was a, this was a phone call, and it was, it was Maureen Baker, who's you know the national yes. training director of, of Les Mills, yep. New Zealand or, or global. Um, and so what, what happened is here in Les Mills, China, so it's so a similar thing where the agency was independent. Les Mills were like, we're bringing the agency back to us. So they, they started to, to make those changes of having, you know, from, from the local agency. So I think it might have been two or three years. So that might have happened around 2015. I'm not quite sure of the date of that. Yep. But then I came to 2017. So I got this phone call from Maureen saying, you know, are you interested in going to China to be training manager in China? You know, there's... The job application's up. They're putting some names in the hat. You know, I don't know if you've seen it. You know, I'd like to put your name forward. And my first reaction was, oh, I don't know, because because China was never on my list of places keen to go. Yeah. You know, but I've been lucky to do a lot of traveling with Les Mills, been to a lot of countries. Um, and when I was in New Zealand, I came to Taiwan a few times. I came to Hong Kong a few times. Um, so I'd sort of seen a bit of the Asian market. I'd come to Japan a couple times. So I sort of felt like I had a little bit of Asian experience. But it never grabbed me as somewhere that I go. I want to live here. Yeah, you know. Um, and Maureen's like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, have a think about it. He said, you know, and the, the CEO at the time was Jane. She goes, have a have a call with Jane and, and you know talk it through. So so what ended up happening is is they offered me to go over for three days, three or four days, just to, to meet Jane, the CEO, meet the team, visit a few clubs, get a feel for what it's all about. So um, obviously with, I guess the experience that I had and the profile that I had that I'd been on a few of the, the Lesmos filmings. They were able to see who I was. They knew who I was. Yes. The, the trainers in China knew who I was. I'd done some yep. work with them. So there was a bit of familiarity. So that, that was a, a foot in the door. Um, so I came over. And then, and then when I was here, I was like, actually, this, this looks really cool. There's, there's big business here. It's, it's like an emerging market. You know, there's, it's, it's vibrant. It, it felt like young, sexy, and cool to do Les Mills. You know, and, and all these boutique studios were opening up, like Lafitte and Super Monkey and Z&B and Justin Julie. It was very small, boutique, group fitness directed studios. So not so much of your big box gym where group fitness was an afterthought in the corner yep. and you had no microphone and there was, a, you know, cracked mirrors and old fashioned equipment and a dodgy stereo. This was, we do group fitness like, yes. and we have Lesmos Smart Tech. We have the Lesmos programs. Yeah. We've got beautiful changing rooms. So yep. I thought, this is cool. And so, yeah, and I, I thought, well, it's, it's a classic case of, you know, I'll, I'll throw my hat over the, uh, over the fence and then I'll work out how I can get it back when I get there. <laughs> so I just sort of packed up and went. It was a bit of a, a bit of a risk really, but, <clears throat> Yeah, the, the, the reason I went was partly because I felt like if I didn't go and then two or three years later, I saw someone else take the role and they got really happy and successful and it was yep. a great project for them. I think I should have done it. Yeah. And I didn't want that regret. Yep. I'd rather have come, completely balls it up and made a mistake yep. and gone, okay, you live and learn. Yep. Um, Instead of doing what if. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of, you know, that that yeah that, that what if. Um, but then also I was, I was ready for a new challenge. And so it was like, you know, I, I need to learn, grow and develop and, and do something new. It's, I, I still wanted to be with Les Mills. You know, it's just okay. Is it a different market, a different area, a different role? And, and it was good timing. This came up um, and I was able to, you know, to, to move countries again because obviously there's, there's quite possibly some good people for the role that just had a family and might not have been able to move to China, you know. So 
I was, I was just lucky that I had the right fit of experience and profile and ability to leave and go to a new country. And when I got here, I, I thought, yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a cool opportunity. Yeah. Brilliant. So your, your role in China at the moment is still training manager. You're still training manager for the team yeah. there. Yep. So, so some countries call it head trainer or training manager, but yeah, essentially the same role. So you're, you're overseeing and, and you're, you know, you're, you're recruiting and developing and growing the, the trainers, assessors, presenters. Yep. But what's happened here is in China is we do a lot more digital stuff now. So a lot more stuff online. We do quite a lot of localization stuff. And so I do a little bit more of the business and the marketing now. So it's just as the business has developed kind of post COVID really, um, the role has kind of just changed a little Evolved. bit and restructured. So yeah. you're still doing training manager stuff. Yep. It's just more stuff as well on top, yep. you know, so, which yep. is cool because because I'm learning a lot more about, you know, the China fitness market and about the business of Les Mills and about how we do business in China, um, you know, opening up clubs, running clubs, how you market, you know, and, and, and some of those little nuances that, you know, when you're just a, a Les Mills trainer, you just turn up, do the training, go home. Yeah. You know, you don't know anything about all that other stuff. Yeah. You know, from what's going on in the office. Yeah. So it's, so it's been a real cool, I, you know, I, I get to bring a bit of my experience and, 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 and bring something to the table you know, and, and help, but I'm also getting really challenged and I'm learning some new stuff, you know, that, that hopefully just makes me better at what I do and, yeah. and who knows where it goes in the future, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, now, before you and I started this conversation, you mentioned that you'd been in lockdown for quite a fair bit yeah. with that. How is the the ind- how is the fitness industry in China at the moment? Are clubs open back up again? Are they still in lockdown? How are, how are things at the moment over there? I mean, it's, it's still a little bit patchy. So we're, we're still just sort of coming off the back of some clubs, you know, had, had a longer lockdown. It depends on which region you're in. So an example is, you know, Pure Fitness, you know, the, the huge well-known brands, they've only opened up quite recently. So some of the boutique studios have actually been open for five, six, seven weeks. Yep. But Pure weren't able to open yet because of the, the shopping center they were in, you know, was the, 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 the whatever the government restrictions were, they yes. couldn't open up a gym facility. Okay. And a nail salon could open up, a beauty salon could open up. Yep. You know, the cafe could open up, but you can't go in the cafe. You can only order takeaway. Yep. So there's different restrictions. So it was a little bit patchy, but what, what's happened is there's still been a big hit. You know, some of the smaller studios privately owned, they just didn't have the money to stay to alive. Keep going. Yeah. Months going yep. We know a lot of instructors, even, even in some of the well-known brands, you know, they, they, their pay has been delayed because the business just can't pay them. So there's that strain. Um, a lot of inst- we've lost some instructors that have just gone. I, I, I can't do this job anymore because the yep. work isn't there. Yeah. So it, there are some dark bits, you know. Then and, and we're just trying to stay positive and come out of it and, and and shape the future. So we've done a lot of, you know, a lot of education and training and engagement. You know, because obviously if a, if a, if a club isn't able to actually make some money, you know, we've got to try and find ways to support them. So it might be, you know, helping them with their online offerings that they can do home workouts, online workouts. So. Yep. The, the way the business has changed is the successful clubs now, it's, it's like a 360 degree platform. It's not just you go to the gym, do a class, come home. Yep. It's you can now do a class at home on their platform. You know, yes. you've got personal trainers staying engaged with online workouts. Yep. We're doing a lot more events to try and get that confidence back of big groups of people. Yep. Yeah, so people are relaunching events and that's starting to grow. There, there's still tricky times because we've still got to do the PCR testing every second day. You still got to have a green code to get in anywhere. So we're still wow. having yep. trainers that can't go to an event because they can't get the green code or they've tested positive. So there's been a lockdown in their compound. So, you know, so it's not out of the woods, yep. but, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is sad because you just know how hard we've been hit a second yeah. time. You know, well, this is, we're, we're coming up to what, three years now? Cause it was 2000, the end of 2019 when, uh, when it all sort of hit and that's to, to 2021. Yeah. The end of 22 is going to be three years in December of this year, it will be three years. So how, how long during that time have you guys been in some form of restriction? Were you open back up to normality at one, at some stage there or not? So, so for me personally, so I was, so the lockdown was actually 76 days and, and it was apartment lockdown. We couldn't, I couldn't leave my apartment for 76 days. So it's very strict. So, so you've got compounds, you know, gated communities yes. and then the gates were just locked and then you couldn't leave. And then so with all these gated communities, some of them might have opened after 30 days and you might have a, a pass where you can go out for two hours and come back, but you've got to sign out, sign in. So there's some restrictions, but there was some opening up after about a month, you know, five, five weeks. Yeah. Uh, I just happened to be in a compound that was a, was very strict. And, and then what you have in the compound is you have like the, the head person that runs the compound, that's sort of like a security guard, concierge, you know, and they're the one that speaks to the local government. And so... Yep. 
the, the thing is, it's it's this zero COVID policy that's you know very very strict. So they they were very hard on it. So I was locked down for seventy six days, and then when we came out of it, I teach at a, a boutique studio called ZMB. So that they were still locked down for you know. I want to say it was another. It was four weeks. So although we were open, like technically you could go out and about, yeah. all the shops are shut, the cafes are shut, the restaurants are shut, shopping centers, you can't go anywhere, but you can go out in the street and walk around. And then little by little, a street would open up, but only some businesses would be allowed, like I said. So you might have the nail salon, the beauty spa, and a grocery shop. Wow. But then the, the, the sports shop couldn't open yet, or the gym couldn't. So it's very, it's really, it's really strange because it is just at the mercy of what the government says. So whatever their rules are for who can open and who can't, you've got to run by that. And then you'd have a street, like I'm near a street called Anfulu. And at the bottom of the street is a cafe called RAC. And at the top of the street is a cafe called Alimentari. So, so I go to those two quite a bit. It's the same street and it's like a four minute walk maximum. Yeah. Now RAC was closed. They weren't allowed to open, but Alimentari could open and they could have people sitting outside drinking coffee. So you're the owner of RAC going, why can't I open? Because I can see the cafe up the road's open. That's not oh, fair. Oh, wow. So that was, that was difficult because we had the same thing in the fitness industry. Some gyms could, some, some couldn't. Can, yeah. And then what we had is the gym could open, but only 50% occupancy in workouts, but group fitness was not open yet. So that was another couple of weeks before group fitness could open. And then it was 50% occupancy max. So I, so I teach an RPM on a Monday night, 27 bikes. You know, we, we could only have 12 that, that first week. It was maximum 12. Then yeah. it was 14. Then it was 18. And gradually it grew. So in the next sort of five, six weeks, which is where we're at now, yep. it's now back to full capacity, but, but only just. Wow. Uh, but again, some some studios they opened and they got closed down. So if if there was a close contact case or a positive case, you know, in your in your because because obviously everything's tracked here on your, on your yeah. GPS and your phone. Yeah. yeah. So you know, if, if someone goes to a restaurant and someone in that restaurant was tested positive the next day, you know, they know that you went to the gym an hour before you went to the restaurant. So yeah. everyone at the gym has to then be locked down, you know, for for seven days wow. and then tested two times. Yeah. So that kind of puts a spanner in the works, you know. But yeah we just got to roll with it you know it's again we can't control that yeah so you know so we, we just try and support the instructors and the clubs as best we can keep yeah. people engaged yeah um, you know and, and it's, so I, i'm assuming during this time you haven't been into the les mills office you've worked remotely uh from home yeah so we we, we um we're all working from home and then the situation now is, is we can go in monday tuesday friday so we can go into the office three days a week yep and two days a week at home um and yeah so um, but wow. we don't know how that'll be for yeah you know Matt, I'm sorry you're going through that. It's it's uh, not trying to put a damper on anything, but Australia seems to have, have our restrictions have eased quite a fair bit. I mean, you know, you've got to wear masks on, on um, public transport, that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, there's more and more people at the moment wearing masks than what I've seen again in the last six months. And I think we're, during winter we saw a bit more of a an increase in that happen, um, you know, being the cold months and, and the flu and everything is around. Um but yeah, that's I'm I'm really sorry to hear that you've been in lockdown for that long and it's um hasn't been hasn't been as free as what it should have been and yeah. But there's really no there's no good way to say it, is there? It's just been it's, yeah, it's I mean, and it, and, it, and again it's mindset. It's it's like it, it could easily you could easily sit on the couch, you know, yeah, drink heaps, eat yeah. chips, yeah, watch movies, feel depressed, <laughs> you know, and you like, like and no one would blame you for that because yeah. the times were pretty shitty. Yeah. Or you could go, all right. You know, let me do an online course. Let me learn Chinese yeah. better. Let me learn how to play guitar. I'm going to read some books that I haven't read. You know, I'm yeah. going to get some more work done, reach out to the team more. I'm going to be more connected with, like, there's there's a whole ton of things you can do to be more productive. So that's where, because we weren't able to actually physically work and do trainings and classes, I could build capability in the team. So I could do an education yes. session online for yeah. the trainers. You know? yeah. I could do some fun videos. You know, I could do some fun challenges. You know, so, so what I found is, I actually created this thing called the five C elements around, you know, around navigating the stormy seas of, of lockdown. So, and it was a bit of a play on Les Mills, you know, because we've got the five, the five key elements. Key, yeah. So, yeah. So the five C elements. So the first one was control. So control what you can control, you know, not worry about the stuff you can't. And then that helps you fix your positive mindset. Um, yeah. The, set, yeah, the second one was uh, build capability. You know, so then, you know, do an online course, learn a language, learn to do a headstand, whatever. You've, you've got time now yeah. in this fourth pause that you can build capability. Yep. Self-care, you know, so obviously things like journaling, gratitude, moving your body more, you know, meditation, mindfulness, all those things around training your brain, neuroplasticity, you know, and service to your community, you know. So actually 
in those dark times, I found that I could pull myself out of being, you know, in a depressed state if I just helped someone else. Yep. So if I took focus off me and went, how can I help someone in, in the building? Or how can I send a message to someone to help them feel better or ask a question, you know, um, and, and connection, you know, we live in an age now where everything is on the phone. So I, I talk to my family more than I ever have done in the five years I'm here yeah. in those two months. You know, we, we had quiz night every Friday with the family on, on FaceTime calls, yep. you know, yep. and I just found, and, and I jumped on more podcasts, more seminars, like Dan McDonough did this fireside chats with people. You yeah. Know, like even now you've got this, this podcast. I mean, yep. it just meant that we were able to do more of that stuff. Yes. You're kind of forced to, cause you, yeah. you're doing it. Cool. Yeah. Cause life's busy, right? Normally in yes. life you don't have time to do that stuff. Yeah. So those sort of five C things were things that I went, right, this is my learnings from being in lockdown of things that are tools that I can use to help me navigate it and stay positive. And then I just share that with the team. And that's, that's a, a session that, you know, you, you put out and it's just a bit of fun, but there's yep. some value within it. You know, if there's some yeah. value in it, someone, then it's worthwhile. But that, that's what I was trying to get across to people that it, it is about our mindset of, of how yeah. we deal with it. And it was all, it was all born from, um, I reread, I don't know if you've read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. No. He's an Australian neurologist um, and actually a Holocaust survivor. So his whole story is around the three years he was in Auschwitz and Dachau in, 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 in the Holocaust. And obviously that's probably like the ultimate tale of like the worst thing that can happen to you yep. in your life. You know, he lost his wife, family, his friends. He's seeing people dying every day. You know, it, it really hard, hard read. You know, and he went through that. But he went through that and he found some tools to help him navigate that and come out positive. And he, and he ended up turning that into, you know, lectures and seminars and writing a book and providing some good in the world from the bad that he was given. So there's a whole bunch of learnings from it. But one of those key learnings is he couldn't control the situation he was in, yep. but he could control how he reacted yep. to it. And no yeah. one could take away how he reacted to it. That was yeah. his choice. You know, yep. no matter how hard the guards were to him. If he wanted to in his head, if he wanted to be in, in like Tahiti on a beach in his head, in his yep. mind, he'd go there. He's there. Yeah. If he wanted to imagine himself delivering a lecture in five years to a thousand people, you know, on how he survived the Holocaust, he yeah. visualized it. So yeah. that to me was hugely powerful because, you know, I'm thinking if I'm in a two month lockdown, that's nothing compared to what this guy went through. No, this is true, man. So who am yeah. I, you know, who am I to be sat on my couch miserable yeah. when I can get on the internet, I can play my guitar, I can watch Netflix, I yeah. can do some, you know, I can order some food. It's, yeah. So it was around perspective and, and, and yes, when something's happening to you, it's still shit. So yes, yeah. lockdown was still bad. People did lose jobs, people yeah. were struggling. That yeah. everyone is, everyone's situation is relative to them, yeah. you know, and, and, and quite rightly, anyone at any time could, you know, feel like, why me? This is terrible. Yeah. 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 But if you're able to shift that mindset, you know, it's, and, and what he showed was those people that could get into a positive frame were more likely to survive. The ones that gave yeah. up and just saw everything as bad as it was, you know, people people would pass away just by losing the will to live. Yeah. You know, so so, yeah. so, that, so I think that's where, although, like you said, it is a little bit, it is a little bit dark and a bit down about lockdown. You know, I, I tried to stay positive, and 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 I thought I can't serve anyone else if yeah. I'm in a miserable state, yeah. feeling sorry for myself. Um, so it was a good learning, although it was forced, and, and I wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah. You know, and it did. Well, we've, better we've, I think we've all decided. Everybody in the world has decided. COVID is gone, and the bastard's never coming back. This is the Group X Podcast. Uh, look, I've got a couple more questions I want to throw at you. The next one is, uh, what does the future hold for you? A good question, huh? Now, I'm not saying look into your crystal ball and tell me your five-year plan because I know that you're the same yeah, as me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what does the future hold? What are your? Have you got stuff on the go at the moment? What are you sort of aiming to, to achieve? So, so, so what it is here, it was a, it was a three-year contract originally, and then I re-signed for another three years. Um, so that would be six years. So, so I've got another year, like, in this role, definitely. And, and and at the moment, I'm thinking, all things considered, you know, I'd hope to renew again. So, so yep. I'm enjoying the job. It's a great challenge. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm learning and developing some new stuff. So it feels like I'm doing things that I'm, you know, not good at at the moment. So I, so I want to be better at them. I want to learn and... and and, and you want to have, you want to see results. Like you want to be able to say, if, if you are going to move away from this role and do something else, you know, what have you left behind? Has there been a bit of a legacy? Did you leave it in a better place than you found it? So I still feel like there's work to be done and I want to do this role for longer. I have to renew my visa every year. Yep. So sort of touch wood, it's been okay so far, but yep. you know, with COVID and restrictions and things changing, you, you never know that one year they might go, well, there's a few too many foreigners here. We were going yeah, to say no. no. You're out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you're sort of mindful of that a little bit. Um, and obviously, if the business turn around and say, "Oh, the training manager role is is 
shaped differently now. There's, yes. there's not a need for you at times. So yeah. Yeah. you are conscious of those things. But if, if, if I'm doing my choice, you know, I want to stay doing this for longer. I've still got some projects that I feel like, you know, aren't finished yet. And, yeah. and I still think I can take the team a lot further and, and be of value. Um, I'm seeing that my role is, is getting more heavily into, like I said, social media, marketing, you know, the online stuff, um, understanding more about the business. So whereas you've moved from being an instructor to a trainer, you've, you know, you've been on the DVDs and done your celebrity thing, you've traveled the world and done all your big classes and promotion events and, you know, you've had your five minutes of fame and then now you're training other people. You know, the, the role continuously develops yep. and it just happens to be moving more into that business space. So, you know, I, I haven't been jumping around on the stage for a while. If, if I get an opportunity for the, for the big events, I'm always putting my team on stage. So yep. part of taking this role was knowing that my role is to shine light on other people. So I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not going to put myself forward for a thank you. Gonna, you thank know. you. But it's just it's it's kind of it's just the natural order of things, isn't it? Yeah. It's like you know, it just, no one wants to see a you know, what what, what am I going to be seventy years old on stage still doing <laughs> pump? You know, because I get the choice of who does it. That's, you know, everyone's got shelf life. But yeah. like I said earlier, you, you you do honestly. I I honestly get more fulfilled when I see someone else up on stage yeah. that you've <clears> given the opportunity to or helped. You know, but maybe I only feel that way because I did have my five minutes. You know, if, if I never yeah. got that opportunity maybe this wouldn't be the role for me because I'm still wanting to be famous myself. Maybe. So the timing's right. Um, and, and I'd like to think it's because, you know, mum and dad raised me as a good person and that's what a good person would yeah. do in this situation. So and I, I, I appreciate knowing people like you exist in our industry. You are the type of person that you've, you've had the experience yourself. Now you're training a team of people. That team of people aren't there to hold you up. You're there to hold them up. You're there to, to, you know what, guys? Yeah, cool. I know what we've done. I know how to do it. Come along. Let's do this together. But I'm going to push you up. You're not here to actually make me shine anymore. You're shining yeah. by them shining. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And and as sad as this is, there are, there are training managers throughout the world that I've spoken to that are in the opposite role. Yep. They are there to shine. To get you guys coming up underneath me are going to hold me up and I'm going to look amazing. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Stop. Get off the stage for a bit. You don't need to be there. You've had your moment. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> there comes a stage where, you know what, I'm going to say this. If you're over 40, you probably shouldn't be in the limelight and trying to chain other trainers <laughs> in that way. Let the young ones come up, man. Let them have a shine. Let them have a go. Get up there and, and you as the training manager and you as the training department can hold them and go, I trained these guys. Look at them. There they are. Look at them shine, and they're training more and helping more people, and I've helped them do that. That's where you tick boxes, in my my opinion. Yeah, but ticking big boxes and going, you know what? Well done, well done for doing what you're doing and helping those people shine and 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 growing that team. You know, we we this day and age, especially even looking at the programs and looking where filming is, and it was one thing I chatted to Sarah Ostergaard about just recently, was the the diversity and the younger demographic coming through. Les Mills have to continue doing that in order to make sure that they stay relevant. We still have an issue, though, where the programs still need to be relevant to our market, yeah? Yeah. to that 35 plus, the 35 to 50s, 60s and beyond. The programs still need to be relevant to us. Otherwise, it gets to a stage where we go, well, it's changed that much. I'm not going to come in anymore. You know, it's that fine line. And it's not, not so much, I don't say it's so much a Les Mills thing. I think it's a, an industry thing and comes back to the club to understand program or teach to who's in front of you yes you need to add the new stuff in every now and then but there's no harm in going back to the old stuff there's no harm in going back to did you say 63 that you're on there's no harm in going back to to pump 63 with maddie and and pumping out the pump chat the 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 bicep trap with him or whatever it was that you did you know there's there's no there's nothing wrong with that that's because that still taps into that market that we've actually got in the club, yes, we still need to stay, stay current and, and everything with that, but we've got to make sure we look after those guys as well. So. Yeah, it is, it is a fine line, it's, and it's, it's not an easy one. I mean, no. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we, like, we know we need to get more younger people in the industry. We, we, want in, we want young people to think that being an instructor is a cool job. It's yep. a good career. You know, it's, there's a buzz around it. It's something they want to do, and they see role models that they look up to, and want to inspire to and you know obviously as a club if you own a club you need new members yes you know and yep. you need you want those new members to be a little bit younger so they stay members for a longer time yes and, you know get more money out of them basically yeah. your club's alive yep and obviously if, if a younger generation are into fitness then you know we, it keeps us moving into the future yeah because, you know obviously with an aging population you know at some point people will stop going to the gym or yep. maybe stop exercising and 
but but you're right it's it's that balance so we, we see it on the forums all the time you know it'll be the, the, the body pump release comes out and then all the old schoolers go oh i don't like the new music there's no yeah. lyrics bring back bon jovi you know and, and then <laughs> the new people are going i went to a class and they were playing nickelback it sucks yeah. you know yeah. you're, never please, you're never gonna please everyone yes. and, and <laughs> and, and it's impossible to find 10 songs that everyone likes you know, yes yeah the top oh, of them. could imagine and that, that presenting yeah. you know it's like you know like on, on stage if you've got people that are 40 plus yeah. is that turning away the younger generation yes they think, i don't want to do what my dad does yes but then when you get the really like the really young hot people on people on stage yeah. does the older generation go oh that doesn't relate to me because she's skinny and pretty and i'm not i mean it is what it is. It's it's you know you you can't have every demographic up there, and yeah. you can't please everyone with yes. presenters or songs. Yeah. Um, but you're right with the market thing. So it's, that's where I feel quite lucky that here here in China we're, we're we're very. It's quite obvious what the market is and what the market wants, and we've got yep. quite clear directives. So yep. when we, when we localize things and when we put the products out there, we're able to hit you know the the boutique club like Super Monkey. They want something a bit different than Terra Wellness, which is kind of like your big box gym. So right there with two enterprises. They're both getting body pump, but they both need it slightly different. Yeah. So, you know, they, their yeah. age of their instructors is different, their demographics different, their member yeah. demographics different, the intensity with how it's taught is different. I mean, there's so many things that go into selling the sizzle to your particular people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and so you're right. It's 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 got it's got to be a big juggling act, and it, and it can't be easy. Yeah. But I but I when I look back at, I I think you know why did I start an industry, and what made me stay doing it for 20 years? You know that that's what I try and put forward to other people regardless of you know it just happened to be les mills and, and body pump just happened to be the main vehicle that i that i was able to use you know or, or took me traveling around the world but but essentially you know someone tapped me on the shoulder and said i reckon you could do this and then those first two or three people that i was involved with doing the thing we built a community yeah so that's what needs to happen and that community can be older people younger people you know overweight people skinny people black white you know a asian european it's it's it, it doesn't discriminate you know yep. connection doesn't discriminate yeah. so you're doing it for the right reasons from the heart and then you build that community you know you will find that place i think if you try and force you know we've got to have a young instructor so let's put one up there but they're not actually they don't want to be there they're not doing it for the right reasons or you know you and i think that's when you, you start to alienate people but you know you, you know I, I can relate to a 20 year old teaching or a 50 yeah. year old teacher it doesn't yes. matter if they yep. do what they do yeah you know either way but yeah um, that that's where I sort of was was lucky, like like we touched on that I'd, I'd gone through enough of that sort of journey. That now, like, like cause it's my birthday soon. I'm 48, and I sort of think, you know, I don't want to be on stage doing body combat yeah. with this guy Nico, who's like 27, yep. who kicks like above yep. his head. <laughs> he's young, good looking, he's in great shape, he, he's, his flexibility is like I would look like a stupid old man next to him. <laughs> so one, I'm not dumb enough to think I can still do it and yep. try and put myself on stage. Yeah. Two, I respect the fact that the market doesn't want to see me. Yes. They want to be yeah. him and yep. the other people like him. So yep. let me help you take the stage. Yeah. So that's where a little bit more knowledge of, of I think the business and the industry comes in. And, yeah. and you know, and those girls were on the pulse there. They they, yeah. they yeah, they've got to cover all markets and, and do yeah. the DEI stuff and it's yep. a huge project. But ultimately each individual instructor, all we look after is is our room, our yes. people. Yes. You know? Yeah. And so true like you said teach the room what's in front of you what do yeah. they want yeah that's, give it to them. that's yeah. yeah yeah until they stop coming you know if they stop coming to your class you then then you're doing something wrong yeah is it is it you've got a bit too old or you're a bit, yeah. a bit out of shape or you're yeah you know or your playlist is a bit too old-fashioned and they don't yeah. want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they don't want to listen to rpm 15 anymore damn it i love that release <laughs> that's what's beautiful about what we do you know it's 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 constantly evolving constantly changing yeah. and yeah uh, you know what one one of one of our lead trainers here a guy called leo he was the first trainer in china back in 1999 and he's still relevant today you know yep. yes he's older he's kept himself in good shape and, and you know he's got the asian genes so he actually looks younger than like you or i would yep. at that age yeah uh, but he stayed current he stayed relevant he's he's learned he's researched he's adapted he's changed yeah. and some of the other trainers haven't been able to do that as well yep so, you know he understands that it's his responsibility to stay relevant if, yeah. if that if it's a long career and he's been brilliant at it he's a great role model yeah um and that shows that you know age you know the, the age isn't important in that space yeah he knows that he you know might not be on stage for the big super quarterly yeah because that's not what the market wants but yep. he's the educator yeah his role now is to educate okay. yeah and, and and be, a, and be a father and a grandfather to this yeah, generation to the... and share his wisdom see that that and, i love that i appreciate hearing because that's 
being relevant, but knowing your skill set as well, knowing where you can still fit yeah. in, not having to be the show pony, not having to be the one, you know, you know the, the, the light needs to be on me. I can still be yeah. relevant and just shift to the side, but still stay relevant in what I'm doing. And I think that's, that's perfect that we need to see more of in the industry. Yeah. In, in across, across the board so that the skill set we have, we can still use and the skill set that, that the legends have when I say legends, meaning the guys that have been around for a long time, can pass that on without having to be in the spotlight. Just pass that on, be part of the team, be part of, of, of educating the new recruits coming through until you get to that stage and that self awareness where you go, you know what, it is actually time for me to take off the cleated shoes or it's time for me to put the bar down, you know, take yeah. the gloves off for combat, whatever the analogy may be, but stop yeah, yeah. and then just go, you know what, cool, I've had my fun with it, it was great. I'm glad that it's going in the direction that it is. Brilliant. I think it's a, it's a bit of humility, I guess, isn't it? And, um, and, and, and I guess that just comes with emotional maturity and yeah. experience and knowing yourself. And, yeah. and like I touched on before, I, I felt fortunate that in my early days of the career, I had really influential people, you know, so Steve Renata, Mike McSweeney, Emma Barry, Susan Tolley, Pete Manuel, you know, that, that, that original bunch, you know, I, I got direct training and coaching from them. From they them. were my inspiration, my mentors. Yeah. Plus back in the States, the team there with Kathy and Nolan and, and, and those guys. But I can still, I can still remember, an, you know, a bus journey where we sat at the bus and it was a super cordial in the UK. And I, and I believe it was going from, it, it might've been Birmingham to London or London to Edinburgh, but, but we used to do a tour, a Saturday, Sunday tour, and then next weekend do it again. Um, and we sat and, 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 you know, you're having a few cans of beer, you're on the bus traveling from, you finish one workshop, you're going to go to the hotel, ready for the next one. And and the conversation I had with Steve and Pete about body pump, it was just so deep and it was, and it went to just a different level around, you know, when, when you're coaching a 2-2 lunge and you're going into a 3-1 lunge, you know, what's the difference? We're not just changing the tempo because the music's changed. Like, yeah. There's a different feel in the muscle. There's a little bit more time under tension here, which is a little bit more difficult, but then you're exploding up quicker. So how are you coaching the different feeling when you change tempos? What is a 2-2 in muscle tension compared to a 3-1? What is the euphoric feeling of hitting a single and then moving into a bottom half, you know? And we was like ripping back the fabric like a, you know, it's like um yeah CSI Miami where yeah. you're deep into the fabric of this, <laughs> this UV light. And it just blew me away because all I did, all I did was go like 3-1, moving a little bit slower. Yep. Like that was it because that's all we did. Yep. But these guys were like, no, 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 no. There's, there's, there's a, a layer in between. Here. There's yeah. a change in the heart rate. Here. There's a change in your voice here. There's a yep. change in your facial expression you've got to be whatever you're feeling you've got to be able to portray that to get them to feel it attach them to the music like what are you saying that's linking the music to that three and one you know and then did you say it again when you change legs and hit the three and one on the other side yeah contextual learning same same feeling same same coaching like i was like no of course i didn't I don't <laughs> do anything like that, you know? but that's where that's like layer I 10 know. of coaching what the hell we haven't gone there yet <laughs> key element six mate key element six but it was and you sort of think like like I just feel like I'm a sum of the parts. I've been very lucky to absorb all this great stuff from people and all yeah. I do is pass that on. Yes, there may have been one or two things along the way that I've created myself that's been cool. I might have said a cue that I invented was great, but chances are nine out of 10 of them I stole from someone else. Yep. I'm just passing on legacy and staying on the shoulders of, of that, that generation. And I sort of feel like I'm in that middle space now where I was the next generation and now there's another generation coming. So my role is to do the same thing. You know, yeah. I, I would love if there was a moment when someone talked about me the way I just talked about Steve and Ida and Pete Manuel you yep. know, and just said there was one moment when we had a chat it was a beer and a chat on the back of the bus yep. and it blew my mind because ever since then I've never coached the same like yeah. that was the moment that changed how I coached yep. you know and that's where the powerful stuff comes in but um the trouble is with our industry is we 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 have set it up to be people want to be famous people want to be a program director they want to be a dvd presenter or, or a masterclass film and and we've made that a goal for many many yep. years i want to be a trainer i want to be the trainer that's the head trainer the the main man in body pump i want to be going to new zealand and being on the filming you know and so we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit because we have solved that narrative and then you think of how lmi works you know we've got glenn ostergaard body pump program director so he's the man so it's then difficult to move body pump into a team program yep. or something that if glenn moves away now who's heading up the program who's yes. the face who's the role model? you know yep. is it now going to be a team of younger people and you know that's an lmi thing they're working on and, and obviously they'll know how they're going to manage these transitions yeah. you know lisa body attack yep. you know it is you know super fit super inspirational super athletic is she still going to be doing it in 10 years time yeah chances so are true. maybe not yeah so what is the what is the next step you know yeah. how do we groom 
what's next yeah. is it another program director or is it a team you know so then we yeah. take the pressure away from one person you know I, I know here in china if if we announce that gandalf is coming yeah the roof blows up yeah the tickets sell out straight away yeah if gandalf's doing body jam that's it it's, it's yeah. not just body jam yeah it has to be gandalf doing body yeah. jam you know yeah so you yeah. think what what the hell happens when he's not around you yeah because yeah there's gonna be a time happens. There's going to be a time, that evolution. Yeah. And people are just rock stars. And yeah. So, yeah, trying to create the next generation of rock stars, but instead of being just one, we want everyone to have a, to, to feel like yeah. they're a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's an, it's an interesting point. But I love it. I think it's great. You know, I, I think all those challenges are, are bloody worthwhile challenges. You know, yes. things that you want to get your teeth into and be part of. Yeah. Because it's the industry I love, you know, and this is what I've done you know, pretty much all my life, yep. even if it was playing football or skateboarding or being a gym, a gym instructor back in Southampton, you know, it's, it's always been about health and fitness and, and yeah. community and helping people. I'm, ju I'm just doing group fitness or, or yeah. group X. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is the group X podcast. Hey, I've got one last question that I'm going to throw at you and, um, we'll see how this goes. What bit of advice can you give to an instructor that might be listening who wants to improve or look to move into a trainer presenter style role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that question because um, because as much as I've talked a lot about, you know, your day to day classes, building your community, the ripple effect, the butterfly effect, you know, shiny eyes and and and, and I passionately believe in all that stuff. There's still nothing wrong with having a goal and saying. I want to go on a filming or I want to be a trainer, you know, because I did, I did exactly that. You know, I, I went to my module training. I saw this guy, Mike Leplac and went, I want to do your job. Yep. And, and I just was gung ho about doing it. The, the thing that meant I went on that pathway was the words that Mike said. So I can still remember it's the end of the training. You're sat in a circle and everyone shares a little bit, you know, about the weekend. And I can remember it got to me and I got really emotional and, and, and it was, and I wasn't expecting it because I wasn't emotional the whole weekend. It was just the training course. But I got emotional and I was saying, you know, before this weekend, you know, well, before two weeks ago, I didn't know Les Mills or Body Pump existed. Before this weekend, I didn't know this man Mike existed. And I've just spent two days with him and just awe inspired. And, and I, I want to do your job. Like the effect you've had on me is that, and I can see what's happening in this room with the other people. That's what I want to do. And I didn't even know the job existed yep. two days ago. Yeah. And, you know, it could have just been left flat or we could have just gone, oh yeah, thanks Matt for the sharing. But he opened me straight away and went, you could do it. You could do it. And I can remember it was, that, was, that was it, just you could do it. Yep. And when he looked me in the eye and said that, it was like, holy shit. This guy moment. believes in me. So yeah. Terry believed in me. And then this guy believed in me. And that was all it needed. So regardless of the skills I had to acquire along the way, it was that belief and having someone believe in me. So what I would hope is that if someone's trying to embark on this journey and, and being a trainer, that they have someone in their camp that's like that because that's yep. really important. Yep. you've got that support whether it's a family friends a team a single person mm -hmm. and then if, if if you've got that anchoring where someone's giving you that belief then you know that's going to drive you through the hard times when you have self-doubt when you don't want to do it when you're tired lazy sick blah 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 so that's mindset and that's the anchoring and the belief then you've got the skills so what we then did was we just were in the mirror practicing technique time and time again we scripted tracks together we got together in team talk you know we, we made, made sure our timing was good so we physically hones the skills of being a great presenter of what we knew to be the best we can be, you know? So there wasn't a lot of Les Mills extra training and there wasn't, you know, aim one, aim two advanced training. Yep. So there was no way to look. All we had to do was keep doing the thing doing together it. and yeah. give each other a bit of feedback. And we sort of went, right. Terry's classes are really busy. What's Terry doing that makes that she's good. Well, she was really hard asked like on people. That was her thing. Yep. So we could see that if you drove people hard, they wanted to come to your class, yep. you know? And, and then, my thing was I, I was connected well and, and told some pretty shit jokes so people had a bit of a laugh in my class and connected, you know? <laughs> sometimes they laughed with me sometimes they laughed Not at me you, yeah. I, 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 was, I, was yep. I connect well you know yeah and, and 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 so so you sort of look around at who's successful in this industry and take what they do you know pete manuel was great with music steve renardo was charming emma barry's a wordsmith you know yep. so everyone has these things so you, you draw those skills and then you just try and do your best but then you've got to look outside the industry so you know, like I talk about TED a lot. So on TED.com, I've got a list of some clips that I watched where it's just a great presenter. Yep. So there, there, there's a there's a guy in there. He's a black guy that's a, he's like a gospel preacher, 
and, he, and he's doing that gospel preaching, how he's talking. And he said he learned to be a great orator, a great narrative, uh, narrative presenter by going to local barbershops and going to his local black church. Because when you watch your local black church preacher preach, the rhythm of the voice, the language they use, the, the intonations, they stretch words out and they, they, you know, they use their body language. Like you are watching an expert wordsmith in action. Yeah. And so he was taking that. And when you go to the local barbershop, it's just the general, because you know, in, our, in our white community, we don't have that. But yeah. these guys you know, in America, they have that. It's, they, they go and they, they talk shit for three or four hours you know, about life, love, and the universe. Yeah. What you get is, is you get to feel that passion of how people speak, how they connect, and how they engage with other humans, how they look them in the eye, you know, the facial expressions, how they use the words, how they put an emphasis on a word, or they change the speed of how they speak. They talk louder, quieter. So you're learning these skills that out of the fitness industry that you can then bring into your fitness industry. So you're now amazing with your voice. Like I didn't teach you that on the training. I just taught you, you need a bit of vocal contrast. Go louder in the chorus, go quieter in the quiet bits, you know, build up in the twos and the threes. But what you've done is you've taken skills from an expert speaker and it, and it could be, it could be a vocal coach. It could be a musician coach, you know, it could be that if you want to do, you know, if you want to be better at, at body combat, you then join a capoeira school. So you get to be absolutely shit hot at the capoeira moves. You go to your local dojo and you do six months of karate. You know, it's you, you've got to take the onus on yourself to go outside of what's offered to you and find these ways to learn. Yeah. So I felt like that's where I grew quite a lot because when I do my coaching for the team, a lot of it's coaching courses that I've done or books that I've read or, or things I've seen online over and above the Les Mills content. And, 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 and I feel like when when you have those moments where you really make a difference quite often it's that content that i've just discovered or someone else taught me that i bring to the party so if you want to be a trainer you know you've got to go over and above learning just the les Mills content you know just just being a great presenter wouldn't yeah. be enough it's what else can you then bring in to set yourself apart yeah uh, and i know people always talk about authenticity and being real and being the natural you and and, and all that stuff's still relevant you know, I, I would argue that everyone's always their natural self anyway, even yeah. if you're yep. being false or being a dork or being stupid, you're still yep. you. Still being you, so yes. Yeah. But so if you're doing it for the right reasons, your heart's in the right place, you've got that community around you, you've got the belief, you know, and you've got that drive, you then learn those skills of what it is. You you and, and there's just no substitute for hard work. Yeah. Hours and hours and hours of practice like like Gladwell, ten thousand hours. Yeah. And on top of that, do the extraneous stuff that you know, that, that that's what I see around me and and, and, and one of the recent roles that we, we gave here was head program coach for Lesmos Bar. Yep. And, then the, and then the trainer we gave it to was a girl called Robin. And, and the reason she got the role was there's, um, so I don't know if you know Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett, you know, that American philanthropist, philanthropist, billionaire, hedge fund guy. He's, you know, super, super rich guy in America for investing in hedge funds. But he, he, he talks about recruitment and, and, and leadership. And he's got this thing, there's this, three parts of the equation is it's um integrity um intelligence and energy and like when you hire someone you're looking at these three components mm. but if they don't have that authenticity if they don't have that integrity piece just don't hire them because they're not a good person regardless of, of the their, other two. their skills yeah. and their energy you know so you might have a lot of energy for the role you've proven you can do it for years and years you're super intelligent with skills but if the, that integrity authenticity piece isn't there you're not a good person you can use that energy and intelligence against Yes. People, you know, yeah. For yourself. Yeah. For evil. As yeah. It were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and the way we discovered this was looking at Pep Guardiola. Pep Guardiola, when he went to Barcelona as the as the the, the coach, they hired him on integrity. Yep. Because he wasn't well known as a coach, so he didn't have we didn't know about the, the skill set as a coach. He was a great player, but as a coach and the energy levels, we didn't know if he could be keeping in the role for a long time. So he's a bit untested. The other four candidates had more experience, more knowledge. But when, when it was, it was um, Kiki Bergestein, I think his name is the director of, of football at Barcelona. So he said he hired Pep Guardiola because when they looked at this integrity piece, he was number one. Yep. And obviously in, in these, these next four years, Barcelona went on this rampage of winning everything all the time. But this it's a really great story about him because it's just, it fits how we hired Robin for her role. Yes. And it was that integrity piece. Yep. But she also did the most work so she worked the hardest yeah and proved for a period of time so she had the other two pieces as well yeah so it was that one the authenticity integrity piece and the intelligence the skills and the hard work you know do there's no there's no substitute for yeah. putting in the hard yards mate thank you 
thank you for thank you for spending what has it been an hour, almost two hours of your time chatting to uh, chatting to this little boy from Wollongong. I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you better. I mean, I, I, I'll share with the listeners. You and I have have crossed paths so many times when my days with Les Mills, and it's been more, yeah, man, the coffee shops over there, or yeah, I think you're on next, or whatever it may be. I've never been able to sit down properly and have a good oh, yeah. chat to you, and I have absolutely loved and that's no bullshit it's been just on two hours if not more actually of us chatting so thank you so much for spending some time and coming on the show and and sharing you and i greatly greatly appreciate it no i, I appreciate you man because it's i've only had to do this one set of two hours but you've you've done this time and time and time and time again with so many people which is you know when, when we talk about putting in the hard work like that is the hard work you know doing it again and again and again so it's been cool because you, you've given this platform for, for us to sort of share a little bit and, and hopefully, you know, there's there's a couple of laughs in there. Some people get a couple of bits of advice. You know, there's you get to understand a bit more about the industry and, and someone who's had a degree of success for whatever reason, you know, how has that shaped up and, and how can that help? So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I like to think that during all these podcasts you're doing, you know, and I've listened to a few of them as well, so I, so I jump in. There's always some nuggets in there that I think, I love that or, or yep. reminds me and so you know, it, it re-energizes and re-inspires and it, and it just brings some good to this Group X world that we all live in, you know, and we're, and we're all passionate about it. We all love it and we, we, all, we all want it to succeed and we all want to be successful and the people around us to be successful. So hats off to you, mate, for, for, for doing this. Yeah, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's cool.